My name is Jane Guberman. Today is Thursday, December 22nd, 2016. I'm here with David Roskies at his home in New York City, and we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. David, do I have your permission to record this interview? Absolutely. As you know, today we're going to explore your experiences during the late 60s and early 70s, particularly your involvement in Chavarat Shalom, and the impact that the Chavara has had on your own life and the larger Jewish community beyond. I'd like to start by talking about your personal and family background so we can flesh out a bit who you were at the time you first got involved with Chavara Shalom. Let's begin with your family when you were growing up. Uh, you were born in 1948 in Montreal, to which your family had immigrated from Vilnius in 1940. Uh, not from Vilnius, but from uh, Chernovitz. Uh, uh -huh. they, they had already moved to Romania in 1934. So and tell, yeah. tell us a little bit about your family's life in Europe before they immigrated. Okay, so first I want to say uh, that I have prepared sartorially for this interview based on the principle of think Yiddish, dress British. So this is my British polo shirt uh, that I've worn especially for this occasion. Uh, two essential pieces of my uh, uh, identity and my past. Um, so I am the youngest of four children. Two were born in Europe and two were born in Canada. And that's actually quite important because my parents had a very rich uh, past in Europe they, um, they met and fell in love in uh, Vilna, which was the cradle of Yiddish secular culture in the 1920s. Um, my, I would say that m my parents were first-generation rebels, and um, m they both grew up in strictly orthodox homes, particularly my father um, in Bialystok, and uh, he was the only member of his family to receive a university education, which in Poland was extremely rare. Um, in 1928, when he received his master's degree from Stefan Batory University in Chemistry, he was one of three Jews, three Jews, to receive graduate uh, uh, degrees in that year. Um, but he went in a... Is that say are you trying to make eye contact with the camera? Did you look like you looked at the camera? Oh, oh, yeah, oh. Yeah, you should look at Jane. Oh, Jane. oh, 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 sorry. Come yeah, on. you're right. Okay. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Okay. Uh, I got distracted. Jane, just um, scooch over this time. It's a bit. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Go. So he rebelled against uh, his orthodox uh, upbringing and adopted the Yiddish uh, secular world. My mother grew up uh, in a Russian speaking home, a Russified home, already uh, rather acculturated. And adopting Yiddish for her was also a means of rebelling against uh, what she considered to be their assimilationist uh, tendencies. So that was part of the family narrative, their youth, uh, their student years, and the sense that they had created a new counterculture of their own. But that counterculture uh, was deeply, deeply rooted in uh, Jewish folk life, in Yiddish, in Jewish observance. Uh, for example, when my father uh, wrote his master's degree on um, the properties of yeast for uh, Stefan Batori University, it was extremely boring because he had to wait 12 hours for the yeast to rise. And what he did to keep himself occupied so as not to die of boredom, was to sing cantorial music to himself, right? Because <laughs> uh, that was the music that he remembered from his childhood. So that's my father. And my mother expressed her uh, rebelliousness also through song, music, Yiddish cabaret. And we grew up in a home where uh, my mother could accompany herself on the piano, and she had a, a rich, uh, extraordinarily rich uh, repertoire of uh, songs in Yiddish, in Polish, in Russian. Uh, even she remembered Hebrew songs from, um, from her elementary school. So I grew up uh, knowing that time was split in half. Your parents came to Canada at what point? So they got out just uh, literally on the last boat in the summer of 1940. Uh, they had planned uh, this escape 
it's a very dramatic uh, story. It was actually my grandfather who masterminded the escape of the Roskies from Europe. It's something I tell in my uh, memoir, Yiddish Lands, uh, a chapter about the last Passover Seder, where uh, David Roskies, after whom I am named, planned, uh, literally uh, masterminded the escape and when, how, and why they should get out of Europe um, at, at that particular moment. So the Rus most of the Ruskies did uh, arrive safely in Canada in 1939-1940. And my parents arrived uh, in New York Harbor on Erev Yom Kippur 1940 with two children, my older brother Ben and my sister Ruth and then made their way to Canada where the rest of the Ruskies had already settled and established a foothold. And uh, my father was then part of the family business, which was textiles. So I grew up in that, in what we call the Schmata business. And Huntington Woolen Mills uh, was a family enterprise. And that's what my, my father did. That was his uh, day job. My mother was it's, it's almost comical to call her this, but she was a stay-at-home mom. Um, but, and what she did all day, I couldn't possibly tell you, but she was always busy doing something. Um, among the many things she did was she was a patroness of the arts. And so our home uh, in Montreal, as was their home in Chernovitz, uh, a salon for Yiddish writers, artists, actors, um, uh, scholars, Montreal was an extremely congenial place for my parents to arrive in 1940 because there was an infrastructure of Jewish uh, secular institutions and they could enter into that immediately and become active on all fronts. The central Jewish organization in Montreal to this day is a unique organization called the Jewish Public Library the Jewish Public Library. It's non-denominational and it serves the entire Jewish community. In those days in Yiddish and in Hebrew and then in English and then in French and then in Russian, whatever languages the Jewish population speaks, that's where they can find their books. And that was the cultural hub of the entire community. Writers came and uh, read their work and were feted uh, so that all of Yiddish culture made its way to Canada. And after uh, having a, an, an official evening at the Jewish Public Library, it could also happen that my mother would invite them for a private soiree in our own home. So she, and she called the shots. She decided who was in and who was out. I grew up sitting underneath the piano at these uh, literary gatherings at the feet, literally at the feet, of some of the greatest uh, Jewish writers of all times, uh, Ram Sutzkever, uh, um, Chaim Grade, Gladstein, not to speak of a whole group of uh, important writers who were Montreal-based, Melech Ravitch, uh, Yehuda Elberg, uh, Chava Rosenfarb, and, and now we get to the, the crucial piece of it. Uh, uh, the other key institution in Montreal were the network of Yiddish day schools. Montreal, like Argentina, uh, like Mexico City, uh, had uh, a very strong network of day schools because in Canada there's only a parochial school system, there's no public school system as there is here in the United States. So we, all of us, all four of us, actually graduated from the same school uh, the Jewish People's School of Volkshule. And our teachers were also the personal friends of my parents. So I would say that I grew up in a space uh, that was called the Yiddish Gas, the Jewish street, which is a concept in Yiddish. Yiddish Gas means uh, the home, the school, literally the street that speaks Yiddish, a Yiddish daily newspaper, Yiddish amateur theater, uh, Yiddish political parties, the Bund was very active, uh, the Farband, the labor Zionists, my parents were labor Zionists, uh, Jewish communists, all of this activity was conducted 
in Yiddish. That's where I grew up. And as the youngest, I was mama's boy, very attached to my mother. And um, I would say that the core of my education was sitting at the table, listening to my mother tell her stories of the past. My mother insisted that history ended in 1940. So I grew up believing that, that time was divided into time before and time after. Time before was Europe, was this glorious uh, civilization, uh, uh, multilingual, spunky, uh, radical, um, creative, extraordinarily creative, and then it ended. The world ended in 1940 when my parents left that, uh, but my mother kept faith with that world um, and consistently, persistently talked about it uh, three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And the deal was, so long as my mother was talking, you couldn't get up from the table. <laughs> so my uh, older siblings managed to conspire to find reasons to leave the table early or when they needed to. But I had no interest in leaving the table because what my mother was telling me was so much more interesting, so much more interesting and provocative uh, uh, than what they were teaching me in school, none of which, of course, was age appropriate. But that was my education, listening to my mother tell stories about the past. So, uh, why would one ever want to leave a world like that? That's the question. That's really the question. And uh, I was a wunderkind, and I was in love with Yiddish. I was in love with my mother, but the way that I could express my love for her was through this passion for Yiddish, which I evinced from a very early age. And I started playing on the Yiddish stage, first in, in school productions, and then from the age of 13 in an amateur Yiddish theater group uh, run by Dora Wasserman. Um, and we were, all of us, by the way, uh, were in the theater. Uh, theater was English language, Yiddish language theater, Hebrew language theater. This was, a very, this was very much a part of our lives. We went to Hebrew camps. I was sent to Camp Masad. My older sister, Ruth, went to uh, Pripstein. So it's Jewish summer camps. I mean, this is really cradle to grave. What kind of education were you getting in the school that you went to? Okay, so a most unusual education. The two foundation of pillars were Geschichte uh, und Literatur, Jewish history and basically Yiddish literature. That was the core curriculum of uh, Jewish studies. The day was divided in half, and all the Jewish studies were uh, conducted either in Yiddish or in Hebrew. So it was Ivrit Bivrit, but all, everything that wasn't actually in Hebrew was conducted in, was in Yiddish. And Does that mean all of the... the no, no, the, the Jewish subjects, excuse me, only the Jewish subjects were taught... the students it. came from Yiddish-speaking Yes, all yes, yeah. they all did. Uh, yeah, everyone still had Yiddish at home, some more, some less, but yes, Yiddish was alive in the home. And uh, you were... You, you spoke to your teachers in Yiddish, and uh, so Jewish history was taught. Uh, we studied, uh, depending on what level you were at, uh, you started studying Chumash in, and translating it into Yiddish, but in the end you were doing it in Hebrew. So um, the idea was that to celebrate Jewish literary creativity, and Bible and Midrash, Sefer Agada uh, were just, and the Sidur were part of Jewish literature. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, in seventh grade, we studied Sidur from the, and, and that's the only time of the week where we had to put on a yarmulke out of respect for the Siddur. Um, and the idea was not that, God forbid, we should become religious, because it was a secular school, but should we ever walk into a synagogue, we shouldn't feel estranged. We should know how to negotiate uh, the prayer book. We should know what the Shema is. We should know what the Shmon Esrei is, more or less. And that was an hour a week, nothing more than that. 
So it was really bracketed. The Jewish holidays were very important, but the holidays were always interpreted in a secular way, much as they are in Israel. Uh, you know, Pesach is a liberation holiday, Hanukkah is a folk holiday, and, and so on and so forth. So um, it was bilingual Jewish education. They taught us uh, to breathe through both of our nostrils, Yiddish and Hebrew. And that was the labor Zionist uh, party line, and, and that's really w what the ideology was. Uh, namely, that Hebrew was obviously the language of the utopian future in Israel, but so long as we were living in Golis, the language, our language was Yiddish. You described Pesach as the religious anchor mm -hmm. in your home. What, what would you say your parents' attitude was towards Judaism as a religion and the practice of religion in, in your home? So, technically, my parents were Yiddish secularists, but by American standards, they were conservative Jews. I mean, we went to shul a few times a year, and we belonged to a, a, a fancy schmancy uh, uh, Orthodox shul. All the synagogues in Montreal when I was growing up were Orthodox. So the shul you didn't go to was an Orthodox shul. The shul you drove to was an Orthodox shul, okay? Uh, that's the way it was. We didn't know from uh, reform and conservative, uh, let alone reconstructionism, which I only learned about uh, when I got to college. Um, so observance, uh, it was a sliding scale. And I should say this, my parents, re-consecrated their lives to Yiddish because of the Holocaust. Um, my sister Ruth was raised uh, speaking German in Chernowitz. My brother, my, my oldest brother Ben, was raised speaking Polish in Krosna. By the time we were born, the language of the home was Yiddish. They never said, they never expressed it in so many words, but now looking back, it's very clear to me that this was their way of uh, rededicating their lives to Yiddish culture, that which had brought them together, and to create Jewish continuity through Yiddish. And my father was extremely uh, involved in Jewish cultural life. Uh, he was something that uh, in Yiddish is called a klal tour. A klal tour is a means a cultural activist. It means that during the day he does his day job and as soon as he comes home he's off running off to various meetings, the president of this and the president of that and, it, and when he's not doing that he's on the phone. So my father was the president of the Jewish People School, the Volkshule, the very school that we graduated from uh, for many years and he was very close with the principal of the school, Shlomo Weissmann. He was uh, the chairman of the Montreal YIVO committee and he was chairman of the Melech Ravitch uh, book committee and, and so on and so forth. So in other words, he always stood up to be counted. And my mother held uh, down the fort with her uh, raising her children in Yiddish and her literary soirees and supporting Yiddish uh, writers. So any book that was, any Yiddish book published in Montreal will have a dedication to Masha and Leib Roskies and their, their name will probably come at the top of the list because they will have given the most money. Uh, so uh, Pesach. Pesach was an extraordinarily important event. It was probably the religious high point and focal point of, of the calendar year. Um, and <laughs> we had a separate set of treif dishes only for Pesach. So that's the answer. They were kept separate. They were just as treif as all of our other dishes. We did not keep kosher. My mother said, what's treif is not what you put into your mouth, but what comes out of your mouth. Uh, we ate ham at home, but we had a separate set of Pesach dishes. I mean, obviously, because it's Pesach. And we didn't eat bread. Uh, we only ate matzah. Okay. So they were conservative Jews. They created their own halacha, but they were really deeply rooted. The Jewish calendar was our calendar. We didn't have another calendar. And the other important holiday was Hanukkah, because that's when my mother would uh, uh, sit us down and she would accompany us on the piano and we would sing Yiddish Hanukkah songs. So those were essentially the two major holidays. 
And for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, like everybody else, we went to shul. I mean, what else do you do? And Shabbos? No, Shabbos, I would, no. Uh, no, the Shabbos I would go for haircuts with my father. But what did, ah, so here's where Shabbos does come in. We asked my father at a certain point whether he would make Kiddush. Uh, so he did. And my mother would light candles. I suspect that in Europe she did not light candles. But at home she did. And it had to do with the school, that there was a kind of expectation that you know, Kiddush was part of making Shabbos, and we didn't, so we had a Friday night meal. Always, always, Friday night meal was sacrosanct. Family and you had the whole family, and yeah, I had to get together on Friday night. So we did Shabbos, and we lit candles, and, and my father would make Kiddush. The fact that you could watch television or do whatever else you wanted afterwards, that's your own business. But Shabbos was Shabbos. Okay. Now, the one, here's where my story, where I begin to individuate. My father did something extraordinary. Um, before my bar mitzvah, he hired Shimshin Dunsky, who was the vice principal of the Volksschule, to tutor me in Talmud. Why? The Volksschule didn't teach Talmud. It wasn't part of the curriculum. And by this, the Volksschule you were going to, uh, by this point, were you in the, still in the... Um... Uh, the I, I, had gradu I was just about to graduate from elementary school, right. right. It only went through seventh grade, seventh grade, and then uh, they had something called Mittelschule, where three times a week you would go and continue your education uh, while you were going to the Protestant high school. And Mittelschule for me was a very big deal. Uh, it was Tuesdays. Thursdays and half of Sunday. It was a lot of hours. And I loved Mittelschul. And actually, more than I liked high school, high school was a bit traumatic for me. It was a Protestant high school, very strict, and I, didn't, I hated high school. <laughs> and was that everybody went? Did the... No, no. Only those who were most committed uh, continued in Mittelschul. But everyone went to the Protestant high school. That's what there was. That's what there was. There, there was... N uh, there was one Hebrew high school, Shana, my wife, went there. Uh, there were two Hebrew high schools, actually, the Hebrew Academy and Herzliya, but they were Orthodox. So what was I going to go? I couldn't go to an Orthodox. They were nominally Orthodox, but even that I, is something I could not have uh, countenanced. Anyway, I knew where I belonged, and they, it was obvious that I would continue with Mittelschul because my, my siblings had gone to Mittelschul, and I loved going there, and these were the things that I was most interested in anyway. Now, back to Shimshin Dunsky. This, is, this was very important. My father um, had a very difficult uh, childhood, wandering. They, uh, he spent his childhood basically in exile during the First World War. Uh, their family fled uh, with the German advance in uh, 1915, and he spent his entire adolescence one in, in the, deep in, in Russia. He actually saw, uh, heard Trotsky speak at Red Square in 1917. So he was there in the thick of things. But what suffered was his traditional Jewish education and he wanted me to have what he had lost out on. So the idea was, and how my father knew that this is what I needed to this day, I don't know, but it was the greatest gift he ever gave me. He decided that I should study uh, once a week with Shimshin Dunsky, who was a Talmud Chochem. He came from Eshashok. He, was, he could have been a rabbi if he had not broken away and become a, a Yiddish secular Jew. Uh, extremely learned. And I was his only student. And I met with him on Shabbos morning for six year, uh, five years, for five years. Every Shabbos morning, I walked to Lara Dunsky and we had an hour-long uh, class in Gemara. So that was amazing because I think my father's hidden agenda, he knew that there was something very restless about me and that maybe, who knows? He read me. He, he understood that Dunsky would have, uh, would be more than my teacher. 
he would become my Rebbe, my pedagogue. And he did. I, I dedicated uh, one of my books to Laradunsky and his picture hangs over my desk at, at the seminary. I have three portraits over my desk, uh, Laradunsky, uh, Sholem Aleichem, and Avram Sutzkever. Those are my three Rebbeim. And so uh, he taught me uh, the way he had learned, basically. He was teaching me Gemara, more or less uh, in the order and in the way that it, it had been taught to him. Well, and then with modern day Mephorshim, what he didn't do, unfortunately, I regret this to this very day, he didn't teach it to me with the sing song. He was too embarrassed to do that. So I never heard the way Gemara was really learned in, in the yeshiva. Uh, he could have done it, but he just couldn't bring himself to get really back into the swing of it. So that gave me a grounding that none of my uh, classmates had. Um, learning Gemara with him, with him particularly, and he took me under his wing, and I, be, I became really his disciple. And he wasn't a uh, radical Yiddishist. He was, even though he was uh, the vice principal of a Yiddish Hebrew school, and, and, and I'll give you one example of this, which really drives this home. Um, in Argentina, they were preparing a, an edition of Peretz's writings. And they turned to Laradunsky to provide the glossary of difficult terms, because Peretz is uh, well known for all the Hebraisms and Aramaicisms. And it's, it's hard for a, a regular reader to, to decipher them. So they, they asked him to prepare the glossary, which he did. And then uh, he mailed it to them, and he got a letter saying, we're going to press and we're going to call this book Hamisha Chumshe uh, Peretz, the five, the, Pentateuch, the Peretz Pentateuch. At which point, Lerdunsky said, absolutely not. I retract my work. You cannot publish my work. This is sacrilege. With all due respect to Yud Lamed Peretz, this is not Torah, and you can't do that. I will not cross that line. And he told me this story. Obviously, he wanted me to know that. So you're, you're picking up a certain message here. There is sacred, and there is profane, and you have to know what the boundaries are. And as, as important as Yiddish is to us, we still know the difference between Torah and not Torah. So why would anyone want to leave a world like that? And the answer is, uh, there was a gadfly, and his name was David Hartman. Rabbi David Hartman uh, parachutes into Montreal in the early 60s. And Montreal was his first pulpit, and he took the city by storm. Um, and he had a, an enormous impact on our lives. Enormous. Beginning with my brother, Ben, who uh, was not observant and probably the most rebellious person in our family, who, thanks to Hartman, sold his house, moved into Cote St. Luke, and became uh, a member of uh, Deferith Beth David Jerusalem, which was Hartman's synagogue. Then my sister, uh, Ruth, when she founded the Jewish Studies program at McGill, her comrade in arms was David Hartman, who had just gotten his doctorate from Fordham, and he established the, the, the Jewish philosophy uh, part of the, the curriculum. Hartman created a youth group that met in his basement. <laughs> Are you ready for this? <laughs> so we're 15 and 16 years old, and this group is called Shomrei Hauma, the keepers of the flame, the keepers of the, the guardians of the people. Of, the, of, of our nation, the guardians of our nation, Shomrei Ha'uma. Who were they? So I knew these, they brought me in because I knew them from camp. Uh, my cousin, David, and the other David Roskies, uh, Shelley Schrader, uh, David Kaufman, these were people I, who were my bunk mates who, had go, who went to these schools, to the Herzliya that I mentioned and to the Hebrew Academy. They went to Orthodox uh, high schools. 
but they knew me and they wanted me to be part of this group. And I was happy to join. We met uh, every week, Wednesday nights, in Hartman's basement. And we did, we put out our own uh, mimeographed journal called Shomai Oma. And um, he would appear for 45 minutes and give us a private shiur. So, Had you known him personally before that? Uh, well, I must have started, that was my first real one-on-one -on -one contact with him. I suppose I would start coming to Shul very irregularly. I mean, I didn't believe in God. I didn't, uh, I didn't daven. I didn't do any of these things. But we were all attracted to him because he was so charismatic. Uh, so we went to Shul basically to hear Hartman. But I had now this, the inside track. Part of this inside track was the following. Um, Hartman had this amazing idea that to revolutionize Jewish education, you couldn't do it from the bottom up, you had to do it from the top down. And that you, you needed to bring together the best Jewish minds and create a kind of Jewish think tank. And he convinced a few Balabatim to underwrite it. So for two summers, two consecutive summers, he brought together what today is the Hartman Institute, but this was the germ of this idea, uh, a really brilliant idea of bringing people uh, who were Jewish thinkers and scholars from across North America, uh, let's say five days, or for a few days, uh, in the, uh, up north in the Laurentians, just to talk to each other and to teach one another. And he allowed a small group of high school students, all of us male, it was almost an all-male group, there was one girl in the whole group, uh, to be flies on the wall. This was extraordinary because um, that's where I met uh, Pedachowski, um, Yochanan Mofs, a very strange beatniki looking guy named Zalman Schachter, who looked like he didn't belong there because uh, he dressed like a hippie and he spoke Yiddish, and, but he was obviously considered to be an important uh, thinker. Um, David Novak, I mean, really from in, in, the, entire, the entire spectrum. These are people who under any other circumstance would never even meet one another, let alone spend quality time. So this was the germ of something amazing. Uh, and to be exposed to that and to know that you were at the birth of something that was beginning to percolate, that if you could bring these great minds together in one place, uh, something would happen and that this would reverberate. This was all Hartman's idea. And I was there um, and I understood zero of what they were talking about. That it was way over my head, but it didn't matter. Just to see who these people were and the level of seriousness and their, their passion. Um, and to have met uh, Zalman, who is going to be the linchpin for the, the next chapter of the story. I would never have met him otherwise. Hartman understood something that we Yiddish secularists did not wish to admit. Namely, that that world was about to die. Yiddish secular culture was in deep crisis uh, and it could not be replicated. It, couldn't be, it wasn't sustainable. And he created his own uh, Jewish day school called the Akiva School, where my sister Ruth broke ranks and actually sent her kids there instead of what she was, would have been expected to do, send them to Volkshola, right, the school that we all graduated from. Uh, so Hartman changed the, her, the direction that her life was going to go in as well. Uh, and this was a, a modern Orthodox day school uh, without Yiddish. So it was a completely new model. So I'm now 15 years old and I'm beginning to see that there are other 
forces out there, much more dynamic, and that Yiddish culture really is in crisis. And it's obvious, demographically. There are no new writers uh, appearing. Uh, the average age of the people in, at, my, at these uh, gatherings is 60 uh, plus. Uh, whenever I would go to a Yiddish cultural event, uh, me and my friend Chaskel would be the only young people in the audience. So when I was 16, I started uh, a Yiddish uh, youth movement. I won't belabor the point, but uh, it was a quixotic but very brave effort uh, to revive Yiddish culture. And it was part of the youth revolution. We were beginning to understand that if we had it, uh, we had the possibility of changing the world. Um, so this was Jugendtruf. This is Um The existential aha moment was something else. Was when uh, Gabi Trunk, whom I'd never met before, a 15 year, I was 16 and he was 15, came to visit in Montreal and we decided on a lark, simply on a lark. We had a play date. Why don't we speak Yiddish to each other? So we started speaking Yiddish to each other and it was the first time in my life that I had ever spoken Yiddish horizontally rather than vertically. I never spoke Yiddish to my siblings, only to my parents, only to older people, and not only to my teachers. Not in school? The kids didn't speak to each other in Yiddish? No. 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 Not in my day. There had been times, maybe decades before, where they would speak to each other, but no. But, no. So that was uh, what I call my Eliezer Ben Yehuda moment. Wow, you mean you can really do that? You can talk about kid stuff, the things that you're interested in, in Yiddish, and use that as the actual living vehicle and, of communication? That was really a, a, a breakthrough moment. So. Even if Jugendtruf meant nothing else, and even if we hadn't published a magazine and had our annual conventions and whatever else we did, uh, from that moment on, I had a group of friends with whom I would speak to, uh, with whom I would speak exclusively in Yiddish, and that is true to this very day. Um, and it was very, very difficult because we lacked the basic vocabulary for everyday life. We'd not, we couldn't talk about sex, we couldn't talk about cars, we couldn't talk about sports, we couldn't talk about anything other than Yiddish literature and, and Jewish history. <laughs> That's the only vocabulary. And food, right? Well, I mean, what else do we have to talk about? It? But what about the rest of the world? So we had to learn the vocabulary and gain fluency all over again, you see. So that's very empowering. Okay. And you can see where I'm going here because there, the, there's a shift in your consciousness when you realize you can live a total Jewish life, but you're going to have to invent m half of it. Certain things you can take, absorb, accept, um, adapt. But at a certain point, you're going to have to make a crucial move forward. You're going to have to make this great leap forward in order to make this real for yourself. And at first, it's going to be hokey and artificial and weird. But eventually, it'll become second nature to you. So, um, so the first hurdle was learning <laughs> to speak Yiddish uh, as my lingua franca among uh, my peers. The second, uh, and this is all my, now I'm really giving away my trade secrets, is that for reasons no one quite understands, even native speakers of Yiddish in Canada, we all, almost all of us spoke with the English reish. We spoke Yiddish as if it were a foreign language because we, we use this English reish. Why am I saying this? Because at the... Um, founding conference of uh, Jugendruf on August uh, 30, 30th, uh, 1964. I got on a train with my other Yiddishist friends. Uh, we were the Montreal delegation to Jugendruf. 
I, as the founder of Jugendruf, gave the inaugural address, and, which I had memorized, and I knew public speaking. I'd been on the stage for many years, so that wasn't the issue. But I spoke Yiddish with this Reish. So two things, very important things, happened immediately thereafter. One was that 24-year-old Label Zilberstrom, and you understand I was 16 and he was 24, that's a big difference, came up to me and he said, Freund Roskes, es passt nicht, as der Grinder von Jugendruf soll reden Yiddish mit dem Reich. It, this is not, it, it's not becoming. You, as the founder of this movement, you got to get your act together. <laughs> you got to master this Reish because it sounds really weird and it makes you look like, sound like a foreigner. You Were you aware of it before then? I wasn't, yes, but not to that degree. I had a dialect envy. You know, there's penis envy. Well, I had dialect envy because my best friend, Chaskel, uh, from Volksschule, and he was my official best friend since the, age we, since the age of 12, not only spoke with the Reish, but he spoke two dialects. He spoke the Litvish dialect that we used in school, and he could also speak Warsaw Yiddish. Uh, but in the Yiddish secular schools, you weren't allowed to speak your home dialect. Everyone had to adopt the Lithuanian norm. So he was interdialectical. You get it? <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, I would give anything to be interdialectical. I can't even speak one dialect properly because, um, because of this thing called the Reish. Yes, I was aware of it, but I didn't know that it was going to be such a major stumbling block and that my whole political career would be blocked as a result, you see? Okay, <coughs> so that told me I had work to do. And the second thing uh, is at the end of the morning session, Mordechai Schechter, who was our sort of uh, uh, elder statesman, said, I, I would like to introduce you to someone. This is Dr. Max Weinreich. It's like re meeting the Lubavitcher Rebbe. It's like meeting Martin Buber. I mean, you can fill in the blanks. And that's when Max Weinreich, the founder of Evo, and of course I knew who he was, looked at me and said, Freund Roskes, die Yiddish Forschung darf ich haben. Yiddish studies needs you. So, 16 years old. So I got the call from none other than Max Weinreich, which I did not heed then, but I certainly did not forget that he placed his hands on my head and sort of with a priestly blessing and chose me um, to carry the flame of Yiddish. So I did go home and I started practicing the Reish in front of a mirror for a half an hour every day. Um, and eventually I mastered it. But uh, I understood that um, that there was, it wasn't clear that we could keep this culture alive. At 17 I'd go off to Brandeis. Why Brandeis? Good question. Uh, so Yiddish is actually the reason for it. And this is also going to be another segue into the Chavara story because you just don't know when you're on a journey how the journey is going to lead you and all the by byways and pathways. Um, Jewish kids uh, in my, of my generation did not go away for college. They stayed in Montreal. There was a very good college, uh, McGill University. And if you didn't get into McGill, there was a second tier college. In it. Uh, but my sister, Ruth, uh, the older of my two sisters, said uh, to my father, you should allow David to apply to, to go to the United States because he's not going to like McGill. The first two years are just required courses. It's not for him. So the deal was that I could apply to two schools. And if I got into either of them, my father, who was a very honorable man, would pay the tuition. And it was a lot of, a lot of money, a lot of money uh, in those days. So Columbia, we knew about because my sister had done her master's degree at Columbia. And Brandeis. So why Brandeis? There was a man uh, named Michal Astor, 
who was a friend of the family, formerly from Vilna, who taught Yiddish at Brandeis. And he took us for a tour of campus, of the campus. I went with my parents that summer uh, before I began applying. And it looked beautiful. And he said that he would take me under his wing. And, and I would be able to do Yiddish with him. Sounded like a good deal, right? Indeed. And Columbia had a uh, real wine rack, so I could, you know, even though I was only an undergraduate, I could certainly try to take courses with a real wine rack. So Yiddish was basically the seg, was what clinched it. I didn't get into Columbia, but I got into Brandeis. However, by the time I got there, uh, Oster was no longer there. He had been fired, probably for his anti-Zionism or because he was a very difficult person, whatever the reason was, he was no longer there. Um, but I was, and, and I arrived in a place that I'd never experienced before, an entire campus of self-hating Jews. I didn't know there were such things as self-hating Jews. Who wouldn't want to be Jewish? I mean, what is this? Everybody was trying to pass as something else. Um, this was a, a real shock to, to my uh, system. This but, was 1965? Uh, this is, yes, this is the summer of 19, uh, this is August 1965. That's right, I was the class of 69. Uh, it's also the, the height of the Soviet Jewry movement. So the first plane, uh, the first flight I ever took was a chartered flight to Washington for a Soviet Jewry rally. Um, so there's a lot going on. But I hung up my shingle all around campus uh, that I was offering to teach uh, Yiddish through under the auspices of Hillel. Who and before I knew it, who was the director of Hillel? Uh, Al, Al Axelrad had just started. That was his first year, his very first year. Uh, so I knew that I had a certain skill set, that I was bringing something that nobody else had. Uh, Did anybody want it? Yes. I thought I would uh, teach five students, and I had uh, two parallel beginners classes and an intermediate class going simultaneously. I had more work, and this was, you know, on my own time. But there I was, teaching Yiddish uh, to very, very uh, uh, motivated students. It was my first uh, teaching experience. Was would, it, would you uh, include those students among the... Self-hating Jews? No, afraid. obviously not. Well, was, so I flushed out those Jews who were not self-hating. So that's important because I could draw people to myself and that I was not embarrassed to be who I was and people warmed to me, right? So I had something that, other, that nobody else had and that this Yiddish thing, and I'd never left an environment that was not, you know, cradle to grave Jewish. So this was really a challenge. Right? Uh, but I didn't have to give up who I was. On the contrary, this, I, I, had some, I, I represented something. And with time, I began to understand what that something was. OK. So one day at Brandeis, um, I'm visiting a friend. And they introduced me to Art Green. What attracts me to him is that he was the last uh, student of Yiddish, of, of Michal Astor, and that he actually knew Yiddish. Well, I was always recruiting people uh, who uh, spoke Yiddish and were interested in Yiddish. My only interest in Art Green was the Yiddish connection. Um, so uh, we struck up a friendship. I got him to submit something for Jugendruf, a piece that he wrote which was about the Holocaust. I even remember what it was called, Shchora Ani V'Na'ava, a title from uh, uh, Shira Shirim. And uh, I also visited him um, in his last year at, in rabbinical school uh, on, on a Shabbos. At JTS. At, at JTS, which was the first time I'd ever been to JTS. Okay. But to be honest, the only thing that drew me to him was our connection to Yiddish. I wasn't thinking beyond that. I was always recruiting for Yiddish. So I thought, okay, Art Green, why not? You know, if he's, if he's interested, then uh, I, it's, 
it behooves me to, to learn more about him and to befriend him. But there's, there's this, okay, so that happened early on in my uh, career. And then the other major milestone, which was going to shake up my life forever, uh, was my junior year in Israel, uh, which coincided with the Six Day War. The, this is the night, this May of 1967. I you th went in May of 1967? No, no, no. I wanted to. I wanted to volunteer, but my parents wouldn't let me. I was underage. Uh, and I was scheduled to leave uh, in August anyway. And my parents, who had already been through two world wars, said wisely, you know, you don't really have a skill set uh, for wartime. You don't add value. Why don't you wait and see? And you're supposed to go to Israel anyway. So we'll see how it happened. And of course, what happened was Israel won the war in six days and uh, I left uh, as scheduled. Well, Israel was going to change my life. So uh, the third person who was going to shake me up, or my third Rebbe, uh, essentially, after Dunsky and, and uh, Hartman, uh, was Leib Rochman. The first address that I had, and the first phone number I had of anyone in Israel, was a Yiddish writer whom I never heard of. And I got his phone number from Yehuda Elberg, a very good friend of his, who was part of this Yiddish literary circle, himself a survivor. And he said, when you get to Jerusalem, call him up. And I remember the phone booth in Kiryat Yovel. I remember the Asimonim. I remember my hands shaking because I didn't know exactly how the phone worked. And I didn't understand that you had to keep feeding Asim Onimi into the phone in order to keep the, phone, the conversation going. I thought it was like dropping a dime in and that was it. Uh, I called him up and I s introduced myself in Yiddish. And he said, come on over at 5 o'clock. And I did and I never left. I, Le Brochman became kind of surrogate parent for me, and this became my, my home away from home. And it was in some respects similar to what I had known before, but in other ways fundamentally different. It was similar in that it was also a salon for writers. Uh, it was a meeting place, but it was day after day after day, from five o'clock till midnight, every day. Every day. So all you had to do is stay in one place, and the whole Yiddish world would and I mean the entire Yiddish world, because he was a, um, a correspondent for the uh, Forverts. He covered the Eichmann trial, for example, for the Forverts. So he knew all the Yiddish journalists. He had spent time in Paris, so all the Yiddish writers from, from France uh, were his buddies. Um, he, the world of Holocaust survivors. Hebrew writers who were tired of speaking Hebrew and wanted a place where they could uh, let their hair down and you know, veteran writers who would be embarrassed to speak Yiddish in any other environment also showed up there. Um, a young unknown writer named Aaron Appelfeld uh, was a Ben Bayit and studied and would read Kafka with, with Rahman. And so it wasn't just old timers, uh, but it was everyone who had any interest in, in things Jewish, cultural, uh, and, and Israel would find their way there. And I began to bring, after I became close to him, I introduced him to my entire circle of, of friends. So they begin coming and bringing their friends. How was it different? It was different because he was a real Rebbe and his table was a Hasidic Tish and he held forth like a Rebbe sitting at the head of the table. And he would take on people and conduct uh, conversations and uh, debates. One of the best uh, chapters, I think, that I wrote in uh, my memoir, Yiddish Lands, uh, is called Between Two Mountains, which is uh, a, a semi-fictionalized uh, dramatization of Leibrochmann meeting Art Green. I'm getting ahead of the story, but, uh, but it's only uh, two years later. It, the, that meeting would take place in 1969. We're still in 1967. Rochman 
who, in a kind of novelistic twist, had the same name as my father, Leib. My father was Leib, and here is Leib. So he really did become a, a, a surrogate father for me. Uh, you couldn't have scripted it better. But he took me in hand, and he, he made me into a Zionist. He said, all of this cosmopolitan stuff and all of this uh, diaspora nationalism, it's just bullshit. Where you, be you belong here, this is your country, you, and, and you have to defend this country and, uh, and no one else. And if you don't do it, then, then who is, who is going to stand up and, and, and defend this country? And he kept, he was really the first uh, adult who took me on intellectually and challenged me day after day to defend my own position and worked over me. And by the time I left, there was no question. By the time my year was up, I was going to go back to, uh, to Israel sooner or later. Can you just say a few words about what, what was the situation of Yiddish? the attitude towards Yiddish in the general population in Israel at that time? It didn't matter because uh, my agenda in being in Israel was to meet all the Yiddish, all the literati. And uh, I'm 20 years old and uh, nothing's going to stop me. Mm -hmm. So just in the same way as I called Rahman, I made calls all over the country and traveled the length and breadth of Israel, meeting the most extraordinary people, some of whom I grew, who, whose stories I had grown up on, of the Vilna you know, pantheon, who were real people. Uh, so th the two poles of my existence were Leib Rochman's home in uh, Katamon, in, on Yordei Hasira, where I was there almost every day, and then uh, Avram Sutzkever's home in a very fancy apartment in the upscale part of uh, North Tel Aviv, where I also could come anytime. I couldn't drop in on him. You had to have, make an appointment, but I was there fairly often because uh, I decided I was going to publish a special issue of Jugendruf, this magazine, in Israel by Israelis. Israelis means Yiddish-speaking people, you know, most of whom were not native-born, almost all of whom were not native-born, but nonetheless, and I did. I got together a group of Yiddish, young Yiddishists, my own age, and we published a beautiful double issue of, of Jugendruf. And in order to do that, I needed to find a printer in Tel Aviv opposite the, the, this horrible Tachana uh, Merkazit, which was where all the publishing houses were. So about once a week, I would get on a bus and go and meet with the, the printer. I was very busy. Um, and it did not occur to me that this would be my last chance. That in 10 years from now, none of these people would still be alive, or most of them would. would all. I just wanted to immerse myself in that Yiddish world. So whoever I wasn't meeting at the Rochmans, I went out and met. Now, yes, obviously, it was very clear that the official ethos was to make light of Yiddish, and who needs this? Um, but uh, you should also remember uh, that the runaway uh, hit on Off-Broadway, the Israeli version, was the Megillah Lieder, which is the first time that Yiddish broke through the language barrier. And here was this musical comedy that kept playing uh, to audiences increasingly who were not Yiddish speaking. So something was happening. And, and Rachman was a believer. Rachman wa was a passionate Zionist, and he convinced me that if there's a future for Yiddish, the only place will be in Israel. So that seemed, if he believes it, I believe it. And why shouldn't I? I mean, look what. Look at the, the, the variety of people that I'm meeting and all over the country. There was a group of youngish writers called Jung Yisroel um, in, uh, outside of Haifa. I went uh, to meet them and they reconvened. They reconstituted themselves as a group in order to meet me. In order to meet me. They hadn't met as a group in, I don't know, 10, 15 years, but they wanted to meet this, this kid. 
uh, who was publishing a Yiddish magazine. It sort of intrigued them. <laughs> Did this help Jugendraff grow at that point? Well, not really. No. Uh, yeah. uh, but who cares? It, as long as it kept me busy. Um, and it kept the flame, you know, lit. Um, but it, it, it showed me that Israel was a, a homecoming. Why? Because I was back in Eastern Europe. I was back in a place where the porters are Jewish, where the pickpockets are Jewish, uh, where the, the most gorgeous women you'll ever see are Jewish. The whole, this is, this is the world of Yiddish literature that I grew up on. And okay, so they're not all speaking Yiddish. All right, so nobody's perfect. Um, but I could, I could pick up the Yiddish in their Hebrew speech. I could, I could pick up that there were idioms that were translated from Yiddish. So, you know, Mataim Elef Lirot Lohol Chot Baregel. It's a Yiddish expression. You what know, does it mean? It means it's nothing to sneeze at. 200,000 lira is not, nothing to sneeze at. Uh, it's, it's a significant sum. It's a slang expression which got, made its way into, uh, you know, spoken Hebrew. So it, I had come home. Uh, I never, I didn't come there as a Zionist. I was very cool uh, to all of that. And I, when I arrived in Israel, I still swore by George Steiner and I was a cosmopolitan Jew and, uh, and proud you, of it. Why did you go? because I, I went there to study Yiddish literature at the Hebrew University, which was the only department of Yiddish in the world, I and, which I did. And I took every course uh, available to me. And then, as I said, my sideline was meeting all the, all the Yiddish cultural people, and then some. Okay, so what was painfully obvious is that when I would visit the homes of a Yiddish writer, their children didn't speak Yiddish. And not only did they not speak Yiddish, but they looked askance at me. So I knew what I was up against. I didn't have any illusions. But with one exception, and that was the Rachman home, where his two children uh, did speak Yiddish, and the older of the two children was a Yiddish, was a, a Hebrew poet, uh, Rivka Miriam, and an artist. That was very attractive. <laughs> and she spoke a, a fluent Polish Yiddish, and she called me not just David, but she called me Duvidersh, because that's how they called me. In Polish Yiddish, it's Duvidersh. David Hirsch turns into Duvidersh. And she still calls me Duvidersh. So that's like, whoa, this is like, uh, oh my God. <laughs> Powerful stuff for a, a young romantic like me. Uh, yeah, and I was starting to get in, go out with women. I mean, it was all together. I'm 20 years old, for crying out loud. And Rachman, Rachman himself, never stopped talking about women. Uh, this was a, one of the major topics of our conversation. Uh, so we had a, he was older than me, but not older in spirit. So you came back to Brandeis. Okay, and now we finally get to the Chavura. So you come back to a campus, and the campus obviously is in turmoil. It's post-68, and you know, we're, we're gonna uh, go to commencement with black fists on our, on our, pasted on the back of our caps, on our gowns. So, you know, the rebellion is, is in full swing. We close down the campus. Were this, you part of that? Did it move you? Uh, vicariously. Uh, one of my uh, two roommates, was Sid Blumenthal, who now is very famous. Uh, Trump has made him infamous. It's sort of, uh, uh, but uh, he was already very politically involved in SDS. So I knew what was going on, but it was not, it was not my cause. It was not my cause. Uh, but, you know, you went on protest rallies because everybody did. But I was never really a political animal. This is not how I express my, my inner passion. But what did begin to happen is uh, we had a group of people. Um, Michael Strassfeld was one of them and a couple of other of my classmates who would, uh, uh, would be allowed to attend services 
at this new thing called Chavarat Shalom on Shabbos. The group was... This is the year... This is... 68. 68. Yeah. So this is Shalom was brand new. Brand new, and I had just come back. And I can tell you exactly what we're talking. We're talking about March of... Uh, February, March of 69. It's my senior year. And uh, there's a carpool uh, going to Cambridge to check this out. Now... So Art, I already knew, as I've already explained, through this Yiddish connection. Somebody else that I knew, who was a founding member, uh, was Michael Brooks. How did I know Michael Brooks? He was our dorm counselor uh, in my, the last year that I lived in the dorm. And we became friends. And I witnessed his religious conversion. I saw him, some amazing thing happened to him someone who was completely American and I would almost say deracinated, found God and completely changed his whole life and became totally immersed in, in Jewishness. And, and then the next thing I know, he's part of this thing called Chavarat Shalom that's just been founded and he's there. And I, was, I watched him change. I never saw something like that, a person transform himself in that way. I, I, it was a completely new experience for me. And, and Michael Brooks is not a, you know, he's a very serious and intense human being. So if he's going to do something, it's going to be, there are no halfway measures with him. Um, and he had an aura about him. So there's this weekly every Shabbos carpool. And the one that I remember, which is going to change my entire life, is Shabbat Zachor. And that means we're looking at March 1969, roughly, because that's when it usually is. It's the week before Purim. And Zalman Shachter is the Shliach Tzibor. Had I seen Zalman in the interim? Probably not, but I recognized him and he recognized me. And we knew that there was this Yiddish connection. And he led a, you know, a Zalman-like service, which I, I don't remember the particulars of. Until, Have you ever experienced that before? Um, I probably knew that, what to expect, that, you know, you didn't know from one week to the next what, what was going to happen, who was going to be the Shalich Tzibor, and that the ethos of the Chavara was whoever led the group was, uh, would determine the nature of the service, right? So you had to trust who the Shalich Tzibor was. I knew very little about the structure of the davening, so as far as I was concerned, the more experimental, the better. I mean, it, didn't, didn't, it was all exciting and it was all new to me. Uh, but uh, I'd never been to a service that Zalman had led. And the only piece of it that I can still recall is the part that was uh, life-changing. When we got to the Kaddish, um, at, the, at the end, he began singing it, Yisgadal ve'yisgada shemei rabah so it's Shabbat Zachor. And what he's doing is incredible. He's connecting Shabbat Zachor to, to the Shoah. And he's doing it by short-circuiting the Kaddish singing the Kaddish to the partisan's hymn. But is he really short-circuiting it? You could say that, that it's, he's challenging the Kaddish with, with the Shoah. But I, I'm hearing it, and I'm in a different way. And I, I'm hearing him say to me, you know, this partisan's hymn is really liturgy. If you know how to use it liturgically, you can harness that energy for, for liturgical ends. It's no less sacred than any other melody. You can turn it in, right. Again, that question of boundaries. Right, yeah. So it goes in both directions. So 
it changes the meaning of the, the Kaddish by singing it to the partisan's hymn because you're bringing it up to date and you're opening it up and, to all kinds of questions. But you're also saying, you know, this Yiddish secular world that you come from, it may not be an either-or proposition. There may be a way of harnessing that energy for liturgical, religious, spiritual ends. And I thought, I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to reach the stage where I can do that. I'm not, I'm not there yet, but that to me is, that's, that's where I want to go. And if the Chavara can enable me to reach that point, then this is the address for me. It's going to have other repercussions later, but for the time being, that was, uh, that was the aha moment. You hadn't grown up in a religious world. You haven't really talked about a growing interest or affinity to anything yeah. that even touches on that. Right. It's hard to piece all of that together. Um, I kept a journal in college, but sporadically. And I was very surprised to read uh, that, I would, that I made several trips to the Boston Rebbe, which I vaguely, I don't really remember. But if I said that I did, then I must have done it. So I'm looking. I'm looking for something, clearly. Um, I knew from the get-go that Reconstructionism was absolutely not for me, so that censoring the prayer book and removing everything that was theologically objectionable was, ne was a non-starter. That if I was going to daven from this book called the Siddur, I had to daven from the Siddur. I had to make these words mean something to me. But censoring it and uh, changing the name of God and circumlocuting, for me, that was, uh, uh, it was just uh, anathema. Um, thanks to uh, Rabbi Axelrad, I actually led a Kabbalat Shabbat service for the first time in my senior year. He insisted on it. I was scared shitless, uh, but I did it. Uh, in which minion? Um, the conservative. In the conservative. Um, yes, good question. There were three different right services, and this was so the only one that I really identified with at that point was the conservative and I, I remember standing up there and I was very, it was very awkward but I did it. I mean it was the first time that I was Sholich uh, Tzibor. Um, you know it was formal and we all got dressed up and all of that. So I was ready, I was moving and I think uh, Israel was really determinative because I came back from Israel with this real hunger. And Brandeis couldn't meet the hunger. The hunger was for a total Jewish experience. Um, and the Chavara seemed to be about as total a Jewish environment as one could find anywhere. And since I was already moving in a direction of, of wanting to learn a spiritual language, all of that came together. Uh, so if, it, if the Chavara didn't exist, if I wasn't at that point, at that place, at that time, at that moment, I don't think I would have ever become an observant Jew. I don't think I would have become what I call a homo davenis. Uh, davening would not have become core to my being. I would become, you know, yeah, probably go to shul because that's what you're expected to do and sit there and be interested in the Torah reading. You know, I'd be a passive behavioral Jew. I would be a behavioral Jew. That, that's basically uh, what, what would have happened if it had not been for that confluence. So the, becoming a member... How does one become a member? Exactly. Okay. And let me just add one other piece to that question, which is the Chavara in this first year 
that you're visiting is a seminary. Right. I didn't know that. You didn't know that? It didn't, didn't register. Okay. First of all, um, I, I don't need the, the 4D deferment. I'm a Canadian citizen. So I never was part of the rabbinical track. And what happened is this. I didn't know any of this until much later. Um, the original core group of 12 was in the, basically in the seminary track. But then they created a two-tiered system of admission. Those who would continue and, and would commit themselves to the actual curriculum, and those like myself who were pursuing a graduate degree or doing something else, but would fit in with the, the Chavara and its ethos and would add value. Uh, but they didn't have to be full-time uh, students. And in fact, we only had to commit to, uh, I don't know, two courses a, a week or something like that and, and other activities, uh, which were laid out pr pretty clearly. So they created a new category for people just like me. I, was, I just graduated and I, I was part of a graduate program. I turned down a five-year uh, sta State of California fellowship to go to Berkeley and study comparative literature with Robert Alter. In order to, in order to stay in Boston and basically uh, become a member of the Chavara. I didn't really care all that, that much about my graduate training at that point. I had a teacher who, was, who would let me do whatever I wanted to do. At Brandeis. At Brandeis, basically. But that, that my graduate training was essentially an add-on, an excuse. <laughs> the reason I was in Boston was all my psychic energies were now going into this thing called the Chavara. This is, uh, I was willing to do everything for this. So what the, was the admissions process for you? Uh, well, I was what they were looking for. And we'll get into the, you know, the, the, the details of it later. But the fact that I came from this Yiddish world and that I represented uh, Eastern European Jewish culture uh, was very important in terms of the gestalt of, of this Chavara, which was really a, a Latter-day Shtibel. Uh, the the neo-Hasidic, the connection to Eastern Europe, the Yiddish, even if most of it was only symbolic, uh, was very important. And I was happy to add that element. And I, and I think art was looking to me to do that as well. I mean, that's the, the chemistry there, the, the, the spiritual chemistry uh, was right. Um, and then the admission process was a, a conversation I know that Barry Holtz was one of the people in the room. I don't remember who the others were. Maybe I was lucky and it was uh, Michael Brooks as well. Uh, but, I, you know, I seemed like a personable guy. And as I said, the profile was right. I was going to do a doctorate in Jewish studies. That meant that I had all the Jewish skills. I could parachute right in to the highest level courses. I didn't have to start from Aleph Beit like Jim Kugel. Uh, or, 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 or Steph Krieger. I, re I already came with a, a BA in, in, in Negis. Uh, so I could graduate to the top of the class. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I, I was obviously on that journey. I was on the journey. It was extremely important to me to be part of this because this this was the only way I was going to become uh, an observant Jew. The only way that I could enter into the system would be through, through the Chavara. I would never be able to you know, become part of a, a conservative synagogue or, or an orthodox shul or anything like that or, or go to a yeshiva or, or any of these things. This was created for me. It was uh, small, it was experiential, and it was neo-Hasidic. It had a certain passion which I recognized and that I was uh, looking for. So all of this got communicated in your conversation with the quote-unquote admissions committee and 
in your your interactions with people over the course of yeah. a day or so. Right? Yeah, yeah. And remember, I uh, you know uh, Barry already. I knew Barry from uh, I guess from Brandeis. Uh, and Michael Brooks I, was very important. Not only Michael, but Michael and, and Ruthie. Uh, Ruthie was also studying Hebrew literature with me uh, at Brandeis. So I knew the two of them. Uh, well, Strasfeld, you said you knew, right? Uh, I knew Michael, but Michael had, uh, didn't join yet. He, he's, he comes later. He's still in college. He hasn't graduated yet. He's uh, the third cohort. Yes. Um, so this is the second cohort. Yeah. So uh, after lunch, I'll, we can pick up and yeah. I'll, t I'll tell you, you know, uh, we'll talk about okay. the retreat, the orientation retreat, uh, and how, you know, what that was all about. Great. Many people uh, point to community as the heart of the Chavara endeavor. And as you pointed out, you emerged from college desperate for community and desperate to be part of this particular community. Um, can you tell us about the very beginnings, what it was like for you as you were yes. becoming a member? My most vivid memories are the very beginning, uh, was our orientation at Packard Mance, which must have been June of 1969, before we all broke up and went off to various places. And I just uh, graduated uh, from Brandeis uh, a few weeks before. That's when the group uh, more than doubled in size. We went from a group of 12 to 40, and I was the second cohort. So even if I knew a person or two from the original group, from when I used to drop in on Shabbos, um, most of the faces were, were new. And it's like that first day of school experience, or the first day of camp, where you've never been to camp before. Uh, it's a completely new environment. And Packard Mance was uh, a retreat center. Did Everett uh, Gendler live there? Or he did. So that's where we first met Everett Gendler, who was obviously cut out to be in, in a place like that, very much at home in nature, and a whole other strand of the movement that I had not yet been exposed to. He had just come back from Mexico. And yeah, he, he, I could already tell this was the radical fringe. Of, of the group going off in directions that I had never encountered. So it was uh, extraordinary because you're meeting everyone for the first time and some people are, you know, are really standouts. Hillel Levine, I remember uh, physically, he looked like a prophet, uh, uh, very bushy hair, and I, I, I have a visual memory of him doing agricultural work, uh, wearing a white shirt. Uh, we, he wasn't dressed for the occasion. We had to earn our uh, keep, our uh, room and board, by doing agricultural work in the fields, which turned out uh, to be a, a disaster. Uh, we weren't, we, whatever we did had to be redone after the fact, but, in, but a certain amount of time uh, we were out in the fields uh, doing uh, and it was, it felt like we were kibbutz, uh, building a kibbutz circa 1920 in the Galilee. Um, so Hillel Levine was very memorable. Uh, the evening entertainment, I, I will never forget, uh, in, consisted of um, a recital. Stephen Mitchell at the piano and Liz Vitale, uh, a uh, on the cello. They were already husband and wife. Liz Vitale was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen in my life. And Stephen Mitchell was, a, was gorgeous. They were an amazing couple. Um, and the two of them as a couple seemed to represent some sort of messianic uh, <laughs> uh, union that uh, I guess happened when you became a member of, of this magical group. Um, and uh, I, they broke us, I don't even remember what the organized, uh, other than the agricultural stuff and having meals together, we could break up into interest groups, okay? And I volunteered to lead a group in Yiddish song. 
And that's where I made my two Haverim for life. Because in my group uh, were two people, uh, Mike uh, Swirsky and Joel Rosenberg, neither of whom I, I'd ever met before. They wanted to, to learn Yiddish songs, and so they became part of my, my little... There were other people there too, but these... And these w remained my Haverim forever, forever and ever and ever. And that's where it happened at that particular moment. George Saverin, uh, I remember, had a terrible migraine headache and stayed in bed for half the time. And I remember, I knew him because we were undergraduates at Brandeis. So that, <laughs> that stays in my um, memory. So uh, the fact that we were away from the, uh, the house that we were yet to occupy, uh, 113 College Avenue. We hadn't moved in yet. Uh, we were only going to move in in, in, uh, in September or the end of August. This is the house that the Havara... I had just purchased. purchased. The house that we had just purchased. I don't think I had set eyes on it. I'm pretty... No, I know that I'd never seen the building yet. I only heard that we had made the purchase. So the idea of a retreat... Remember, all of this is new. There was no such thing as a Jewish retreat center in 1969. It hadn't been invented yet. So if you wanted to do retreat, you had to go to a non-Jewish environment. And that's what we would do uh, every, uh, you know, either we would go to a Ramah camp, which we did for uh, Sukkot, uh, or we would rent space at a Christian uh, retreat center. I was married uh, at a Lebanese uh, Christian re retreat center uh, near Methuen, Massachusetts, uh, a few years later. Uh, so, and, and we had just enough time to take the crosses off the walls before my parents arrived. <laughs> so, uh, retreats and being out in nature. So, that was going to be part of the communal thing. Avodah uh, begashmiut meant also you're using your body in a different way and, and entering into the cycle of uh, nature and putting those pieces together. The first, sukkahs, uh, the first sukkah that I ever built as an adult was the retreat that we did at, at Palmer, I guess, where we built a sukkah. Up until then, my only association with sukkahs was as a child in Folkshula, and only children did that. It was, a child, it was a children's art activity and nothing more than that, that it could have any real significance. So, you know, Everett was really into nature symbolism and all, you know, pig and, mother, and mother worship and mother goddesses and all kinds of amazing things that were very heady. It wasn't my language, but it was a language. And it was obviously a, a legitimate uh, part of the, of the, the larger picture. So music and song, and it, I guess that was, the, Packard Mance was validating for me for that very reason, is that, okay, if I could teach Yiddish song, and that was validated, that already signaled to me um, that I, I brought something to the table. And somehow or other, that was going to be part of this new thing that we were creating. Um, so uh, uh, that, that was extremely significant. Not to speak of, you know, the friendship, uh, the actual friendships that you create. So, chaver. Let's think about this term. Um, I mentioned that there was a two-tiered system. And there was talk of creating a chaver, which would be an alternative to the rabbinate. That when you finished the program, you wouldn't become a rabbi, but the, your title would be chaver. And you would go into the, off into the world with this new name called chaver. Whether that happened or not, whether anyone achieved the official status of chaver, I couldn't say. But it was there as a kind of utopian idea and ideal. But we nonetheless recreated 
a new norm of, of what Haver was. So let me try to unpack that. One obvious piece is Chevrusa. You know, you have a study partner, and we were going to do studying together. And I had a, ch a Chevrusa, and that was Mona Fishbane. Uh, we were in the in arts advanced Chassidut class, and she became my study partner, but much more than that, because she was the first married woman with whom I had an, a real open relationship that I could talk to her about anything. And the nature of study at the Chavara was that it could lead in any number of directions, because the text was your life, and you were living the text. So uh, having her as, as my Chavrusa was very special, and it felt extremely grown up. Um, this is not college anymore. This is real life, and these are a, it's a different kind of relationship around study, but she's your spiritual partner as well. It's not just an intellectual give and take. There's something else at, uh, at stake here. Were there many women? So at that point, it was only spouses. The first year, there were as yet no independent women members, if I remember correctly. So there was Janet Holtz, uh, certainly uh, Kath, uh, Kathy Green. I would call them the Imahot. We had our own Imahot. Um, Ruthie Brooks was not so much an active member. I don't remember her as such a visible presence, but she was married to Michael Brooks. And going to their home for a Shabbat meal was an extraordinary experience that they did together. They crafted this thing called a Shabbat meal, which was unlike any other Shabbat meal. And that was true of anybody that you, you know, you walked into a person's home and there was a different aura that each person created around the Shabbos uh, table. So Buzzy and Mona, the Fishbane, were, were a unit. I don't remember ever going to their home for a Shabbos meal, but I would see Mona, as, as I just said, as my, as my study partner. So there were these married couples that went together. You, know, you didn't mention one without the other. And I actually was close to, to a number of them, uh, to Janet, uh, I think, in, in particular, and uh, to um, Epi, uh, Seymour Epstein and Eva. They were our Canadian, I was not the only Canadian, but they were from Toronto and I was from Montreal, and they were already married. Um, and they were very much a, a, a unit, even though he was the real member and she was less interested. Um, Haver. So Haver meant Chavrusa, and I was lucky to have a, a study partner. But here's the thing. Um, the closest analogy is, is something from my parents' life. There's a Yiddish word called Shifsbruda, uh, a Shif's brother or sister. Somebody who made the ocean crossing with you from Europe to freedom. In the case of my parents' generation, it was to America. But, and, and it goes back another generation. A Schiffsbruder could have been someone who immigrated with you and you met them on the boat. But the thing is this. These are people, if you weren't on that journey, you'd never meet them because they're from all over the place and only the vicissitudes of life and history have thrown you together on that boat. But that ocean crossing is the most significant thing you've ever done because you are transitioning now from a state of servitude to some place that's going to be your liberation. And you're full of expectation and mm, you're very nervous and uh, apprehensive because you don't know what's there on the other side. You only know that you have to get there and that your life is going to be changed. And you're meeting these other people who are all undergoing the transformation together with you. That's what the Chavara was. That's what it was. We were all coming from extremely disparate places. 
and some were in flight, some were in, you know, had just come out of a crisis or, you know, every story is different. But we were the Schiffsbrieder and that experience of crossing the ocean would be what we would have in common for the rest of our lives. And if it weren't for the ocean crossing, we wouldn't have met. When would I have met Joel Rosenberg from, from California? I mean, no, impossible. Uh, Mike Swirsky had already graduated from JTS and uh, he was fed up with the rabbinate. And maybe I would have met him later in Israel, possibly, but we would never have been friends if we had not been Haverim uh, to begin with. When would I have met Steve Mitchell, uh, someone who was on the verge of uh, converting to Catholicism? when he was at uh, Yale, and the, and the deal at Yale was uh, that th the, the, the Catholic uh, um, clergymen, if you came to convert, they would send you back to where you came from. Before they would accept you for a conversion class, they would send you back to where you came from. So who was the, the Hillel chaplain? Uh, um, uh, um, Dick Levy, Richard Levy. Uh, who changed his life and so he became uh, a Jew again and learned Hebrew and sat down to translate the book of Job and then and then joined the Chavara having already translated the book of Job after having taught himself Hebrew I mean really uh, okay uh, Jim Kugel uh, Steph Krieger all these people uh, that came together uh, for so many different reasons. And when you're on the boat, you know that your life is about to change. So you're, you're right for that. You're open for it. Okay, so once you join this uh, group and it, the self-consciousness, I think it takes a long time for it to wear off. I think we were all pretty, at least that second cohort that I was a part of, it took a while to grow into your role. Um, so you had to change your, there was a dress code. You had to have your, you had to have long hair. Okay, so this is me uh, as my, in the Chavara with my long hair and, uh, rimless and my rimless glasses, yes, looking very spiritual. And this picture was actually taken in the Chavara. Uh, when a photographer and a journalist came from Hadassah magazine to do a story on us. And Richie Siegel was there, and I was there, and Mona was there, and our three pictures will later appear in Hadassah magazine. Uh, the three flower children uh, representing uh, this new generation. Um, so the dress code, uh, long hair uh, is absolutely uh, a requisite part of it. Um, women, you know, loose blouses, long skirts. Um, if you have a psychedelic talus, uh, you know that uh, this was uh, the invention of Zalman. He had this thing called a talisarium, which he had created already a decade before, uh, where he would take kids and uh, in camp, I think. It started at Camps Ramah where they would design multicolor talesim and then they would bring the talesim back to their conservative shuls and all hell would break loose. And the rabbis say, but no way are you going to wear that ridiculous thing in, in the sanctuary. But why not? It's a kosher talis, you see. Uh, you know, so uh, slowly you begin to insinuate your way into the Jewish establishment by your dress code. So having a multicolor talis is, is a big deal. Learning to wear uh, not one of these dinky talesim that they gave you in, in, in synagogue, these little silk thingies that look like a scarf. Learning how to wear a full talus. It's not so simple, you know, folding it. It took, took me six months to figure out what the hell to do with how to fold it so that it looked like what other people were doing, but you had to learn it. Uh, it doesn't come naturally. <laughs> you learn just by imitating, or did someone teach you? Uh, it's probably someone end up having. To, someone must have politely tell, told me, you know, you're not doing it right. 
it's very simple. All you have to do is fold it this way and then it'll stay on your shoulder and then the problem is solved. But there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And, um, okay. Um, speech, there was a speech code, all of which is unwritten. Uh, you have to learn how to, sp to talk in blank verse. <laughs> You can't use profane language in the Chavara. You have to learn a new vocabulary. I'm already talking way too loud to be a real... Uh, you're supposed to speak much more quietly. Uh, you don't raise your voice as much. Uh, there is time for, for boisterousness, and there were people in the Chavara whose official role was to be prankster. Larry Lofman was an official prankster. Um, Arnie Cover was a, was a prankster. Uh, Epi loved to be uproarious, but really, you know, for communal things, for meals, there was a, um, a rule of, uh, of decorum, which probably is closer to a monastery uh, than it is to, to anything particularly Jewish. Um, lots of silence, lots of silence, lots of silent meditation which is something that I never warmed to, never warmed to. But uh, I, I'd never gone to an ashram. It never appealed to me. My rule of thumb is silence is not a Jewish form of self-expression. <laughs> but it was for other people. And you had to respect uh, the silences and the long silences. Ah, so here's a piece of folklore um, that I heard from uh, Steph Krieger. Uh, that Steve uh, Zweibaum's uh, interview, when he came to interview, he's the first cohort, uh, consisted of him sitting opposite Art in a room for a half an hour and not saying a word, but just smiling. His Ch Cheshire Cat smile, and that was enough. That, that's, that's enough. That's enough. Okay. So, um, so there was you had to learn a different vocabulary. When I wrote my chapter uh, in my memoir, Yiddish Lands, about the Chavara, it's the only chapter in my memoir that's not written in translation. By which I mean all the rest of the book was really happening in another language, usually Yiddish. And I, I'm translating for the reader and interpreting. The Chavara chapter is the only one where I tried to actually capture the cadence of the English that was spoken, and it was on a much higher linguistic pitch, uh, using words that you, 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 know, you never used before. Uh, it was a whole different spiritual vocabulary that you were supposed to make your own. Um, okay, so there's the dress code, uh, one for men and one for women. Uh, there's the speech, food, yes, the consumption of food, uh, very important, and especially for communal meals, um, which we did a lot of. We had uh, a, a, an obligatory communal meal on uh, Wednesday nights. And at these meals, you were supposed to be pretty quiet. And the kinds, ah, and now we come to the music. The music is very important. The Chavara coincides with the Negonic Renaissance. Uh, we just appear on the scene of just a few minute, a few years later, after the first LPs appear of real Hasidic music, of Mojits and uh, Chabad. The the records that still had warning labels, do not play on the Sabbath or festivals. Um, and the person who had the largest collection of such records was Hillel Levine, because his father and uncle owned Levine's bookstore on Eldridge Street. So he had a complete collection of these songs, and he knew them all. Um, so the mechanical means of reproduction, named to begin with records, will play a very important part. Someone brings these songs and teaches them uh, to the group. Up 
the only person who came with the whole cultural baggage uh, was uh, Reb Zalman. But he was only there intermittently. Uh, if he was on, I think our year, he, he was on sabbatical from Manitoba. Okay, so we saw more of him. And then he disappeared. Uh, no more Zalman. And so he, whatever impact he had, he had. And then we would meet up with him you know, at various occasions. Um, so he obviously was a repository of nigunim and all kinds of, and body language, body language. He, one Shabbos morning, he taught us how to shuckle and that there, there are different ways of shuckling and each Hasidic group shuckles differently. Now, I don't know, I hope he had, he, he managed to record this before he died because this is a Torah Shavalpe that is well worth preserving that you don't, re, that you don't find in, in any written source. But he taught us. Uh, the art of shuckling. Um, so the meals. We've never, none of us had ever had a meal like this. None of us grew up with this. This was something that evolved, that we created. So this was the communal meal, the Wednesday night. Yeah, meal. yeah. Uh, but we actually met twice a week. Once was uh, Sudash Lishit, uh, where we were all supposed to come back to the Chavura. And here at Dvar Torah, uh, somebody actually give a Dvar Torah. I think that Shabbos morning, there, it was just discussion. I, I'm pretty sure I'm remembering this right, that there was to, a pretty wide-ranging Torah discussion. But a formal presentation, if there was one, would be at Dash Lishit, which was only for Haverim. Remember that on Shabbos morning, it was opened to the public. So that already sort of dissipated the magic. But Tzudash Lishit was only for the group, and it was that magical transitional time where someone would speak and we would sing the Nigunim. Can you set the scene for that? I mean, just cast back in your mind's eye and what, what does it look like where you are? What's the atmosphere? Oh, so um, it's on the main floor. Yes. Okay, so there are basically only three rooms on the ground floor. One is the davening space, which is only used for davening, and that's where the, the, the pillows are on the floor, and there is an aron made out of, a, which is a basket, which is our aron kodesh. Uh, and it, it's not a multi-purpose room. As far as I remember, we only used it for, for prayer and meditation. I think that's right. Off on two sides, uh, so is a room uh, where you can just, with couches that you can sit around. And then on the other side is a room with tables, which is the, the study space. And there was another classroom upstairs as well, which was also with the, just a table and, and benches. So I think it's, we're, we're talking about sitting around the table. That's what I remember that it's the room adjacent to the study, to the, to the tefillah room, to the prayer room, uh, to <laughs> the chapel, if you will, and everyone's crowded around the table, and there's food, and somebody's at the head of the table speaking, and I think probably sing a nigan to set the mood, and... New lights. Hmm, are there any lights? I don't know. It's probably, there may be. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there was incense or anything like that. It's just a, a liminal moment at the end of Shabbos. And the fact that we're all together and that we're just about to go each our own way. But I couldn't recreate for you what the lighting was and whether there were candles, I don't remember. I did one of those, which was extremely meaningful uh, for me. And that was really a, kind of a coming of age because I spoke about where I was on the journey and about my relationship to Yiddish and how that was changing in the Eastern European past. And I was weaning my way, myself away from the romance of the past in order to embrace this new model as being <coughs> equally authentic. For me, that was the thing, you know, are we play acting or is this real? 
is, is this a real alternative? And it was beginning to feel like a real alternative, uh, even, even though we were making it up as we went along. And I remember Joel Rosenberg doing a presentation, and he spoke in Hebrew and in Hasidic English. It made absolutely no sense, but it was just magical. <laughs> because it was, it was this other language, which nope, you, know, you couldn't understand it, but it sounded right. It sounded like what a Dvar Torah would be if you, know, if, if you were giving it in three languages at the same time. Uh, he was also learning Yiddish. He was one of my students. He had studied, begun studying Yiddish in California. And, gee, was I giving a Yiddish class? I may have been t actually teaching Yiddish, uh, to come to think of it. Uh, I gave a formal class as part of the, the Lair House, but okay, we'll come, yeah, we'll come back to that. Um, okay, so Sudash Lishit had a certain aura, there's no question, because it's still Shabbos, right? And you're, you're still feeding off that, that moment, and we've been together. Uh, we didn't have Friday night services, by the way. Uh, there were, but it wasn't obligatory. Shabbos morning was obligatory, and Sudash Lishit. You were starting to talk about the Nigunim. Yes, okay. So where, where I remember them being really important was for the Wednesday night communal meal. Because you had to observe a different decorum. So what's different? Remember that one of the ways, excuse me, one of the ways you define a group is by what you're not. What we weren't was we weren't Camp Rama. I didn't know that at the time, but I figured it out later. What, what did, there were always people, you were always, the, the last time you were at a table with young Jews was in camp. Okay, and what did you do? Bang on the table and you know, he's singing these camp songs at the top of your lungs and, and it's how, no. Verboten, that is absolutely not what is, it's absolutely unacceptable. So this alternative musical culture was essential to our very essence. If we were going to create a spiritual language then, and we were going to do it through music, where were we going to learn these? These are not things that any of us knew growing up, okay? What? So the records were where we learned them, and that, uh, and, and so the, the most popular, the, the most compelling ones were the Dvekas Nigunim. A Dvekas Nigun is, is kind of like a mantra, where you repeat, the, you repeat it over and over again, and, and oftentimes it has no words. It's just the melody, and you repeat it again and again and again. Okay, so one of the Dvekas melodies we, I know where we got it from. Uh, it came from a movie. It came from the 1937 Dibuk, Poland 1937, which opens with a scene of Hasidim in uh, Shul, and this is what they're singing. I die, 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 I am. Ay, 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 yam. Ay, 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 yam. Ay, 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 yam. And then you repeat it. And then the second part is Ay, 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 yam. Ay, 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 yam. And you go back to the beginning. Okay, so it's sung a few times and it becomes a kind of late motif in, in the movie. And this is actually a real, it's the real deal. It's the real deal. I, I did a lot of research on this play and on the, uh, a Jewish ethnomusicologist named Joel Engel was on an expedition in 1911 with, uh, with Ansky, and they, they recorded these melodies on, on the first uh, Cylinder. cylinders, yes, and, and that's where, and, and then it became part of the fixed repertoire of every production of the Dibbuk, 
uh, in Yiddish, maybe in Hebrew too. So I arranged for a screening of this someplace where I remember the whole Chavara came for this and the melody just took off and that we adopted it. Uh, while I was still at the Chavara, uh, Barry Holtz uh, used it for Kedusha, I think on Rosh Hashanah. Uh, I think he was the one who really understood how powerful this was and that it really could be turned into liturgy. So I, I just, I'm citing that as, a, as an example of the kind of musical culture, something um, like a mantra where music is supposed to transport you into another sphere of, of consciousness. And the power of it was the thing itself and that you were turning your back on the musical culture that you grew up on. Now, one Shabbos, Mike Swirsky, also a graduate of Camps Ramah, also uh, the same class, rabbinical school classes as Art Green from JTS, decided to do a straight Ramah style service. And, and the rule was that you had to trust the Shaliyah Tzibor, whatever, wherever the Shaliyah Tzibor took you, you, were have, you had to go with them. So he did a straight Ramah style davening. Which at, is what? Uh, it's, it's conservative. It's just the conservative Nusach. And that's, ah, so uh, the point is Nusach. Okay. So there are two competing principles. One is Nusach, which is the way, you know, the melodic line, you know, for Shachris, for Musa, for Mare, for... Uh, you know, for, that, that, that's, you learn it in junior congregation and when you go to Camp Ramah, you lead the services and that's how you show that you're one of the boys, is that you, you've learned the, 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 the standard melodies. We introduced something or, or reclaimed something very different, which was the niggin. And a niggin could be several things. Um, but one, th one is that it personalizes the davening because you are introducing a melody uh, out of, out of, from a different place. And you're, shake, you're, making the, you're making it new. You're doing something innovative. You're changing the rhythm. You're changing the flow. Um, Zalman was, of course, the master at this, finding the niggin that matched the words. The, okay, so that you're singing a normal prayer, but to a different melody, which is altogether creates a whole new set of meanings. Okay, so it's not just singing a melody and interrupting. Uh, you could do that too. Uh, that's perfectly okay. You can slow down the davening in order to introduce a melody and to change the mood and whatever. But to adapt a melody to words, that's already a second uh, tier. Um, so it creates, it, it, it's like the difference between a classical composition and jazz. Right? So a classical composition, you go to a concert and you expect a certain performance, you know what the score is, and you appreciate it as performance, how close they are or how closely they adhere to or interpret. But a jazz concert is half improvisational. <coughs> okay, so a niggin is, is like jazz. It, it's, it's half improvisational. Um, and it was a very tall order to learn all of this. Uh, so if you grew up, grew up as half of the group did, already knowing the Nusach because they had, like B Barry Holtz, being in a junior congregation, or like uh, half of them having gone to Camps Ramah, that's what you learned. Okay, so shaking things up, okay, so you learn how to shake things up. But s supposing you're like me, and you don't even know the Nusach yet, you're still learning the ABCs, but you're supposed to be able to do that and do the, the next step, the, uh, the improvisational. Very hard to learn all of that uh, together. So uh, 
I learned everything backwards. I, uh, it took me much longer to learn the nusach than to learn the improvisation. So my, you know, for me, davening was first and foremost the improvisational part and, and adapting melodies. Because I, 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 I don't have any musical training. And for me to learn nusach is a matter of rote repetition. It took me an extremely long time. Um, so a meal could become a, a, a kind of service. It, because of, if, you, if you capture the right nigunim, then it's almost like you're davening, right? Because the, the nigun is really what holds it together. So I didn't finish the story. Um, Mike Swirsky, one Shabbos morning, decided, you know, it's perfectly acceptable. I mean, we, let's do a straight, traditional, conservative-style davening, okay? At which, somewhere into the davening, Art stood up, Art Green, Art Green and walked out of the room. Okay, that was unacceptable. So he wasn't going to stop Swirsky, out of respect for him, but he wasn't going to sit there either, because for him, this wasn't davening anymore. This was totally non-spiritual. It was such a downer that he might as well not even be there. Okay. So, you see, you see what, what, what the tension here is. And to go back to the communal meals. Yes. The nigunim, in part, were about transforming the meal into a spiritual occasion. Yes. It's, the table is your altar. Yes, is your altar. Right. Definitely. The table is your altar. And that is, what, that is what's wrong with the yes. Ramah banging on the table, etc. That's right. And I think it's true. I mean, we're, that, that's exactly right. So, where are we going with this? The power, the cumulative power of, you know, you, uh, of all of the, You could walk in and you could say, oh, this is ridiculous. Why are, we, why are all these hippie types sitting on the floor on pillows and it's not Jewish and it's like an ashram and it's all play acting and uh, what is this? And, no, and they Yeah, yeah. Um, but we're, we're adopting certain forms uh, that are both, it's coming from a modern sensibility and it's coming from our exposure to many different religious and spiritual strands, but we're making it Jewish. We're making it Jewish, and that's what worked. So, beginning with the very concept of Chavura, mm -hmm. beginning with that very word, which is different from Farbrengen, and is different from Reb Zalman's B'nai Or, or it's different from the House of Love and Prayer, which is very California, and then, you know, you, you hear that term and it conjures up all kinds of things, and psychedelics and, you know, whatever. You take this term, Chavara, which nobody uh, has, had used before. Uh, uh, Jacob Neusner gave all, all of us complimentary copies of his book on the Chavara in second century Judaism and wanted to believe that we learned it from him and that he was kind of the guru of the movement, but it, it came after the fact. So Chavara has to do with being a f sacred fellowship, creating a new model of affiliation, which is the Chaver. But really, but all of that would have been without substance if it weren't for Hasidism. So that's why the, that's the, key, the key here is, is the, the nigan and the musical culture. Because I think whether we knew it or not, we were creating a co-educational shtibel. Uh, that it, Hasidism, actual, in actual fact, was core to the curriculum. Certainly for me, that's uh, what I was most interested in, in studying. It had to do with the genealogy, the spiritual genealogy of 
Reb Zalman, Heschel, and Art. Okay, and we all knew that Art had been uh, Heschel's Talmud, you know, Muvhak, and that he had learned from the source. And Heschel was our source in two respects. Not only was he the, uh, a scion of, of Hasidic dynasties, and not only was he a scholar of Hasidism, but he was a social activist. And he had marched in Selma with uh, Martin Luther King so, uh, Jr. So he was everything. He was the Chavara and the Shalom. He was also you know, the, the, spirit, the, the, the social activist, and it, all in one person. Hasidism became, uh, I think, is really the glue that held it all together. This idea that in our musical culture and in the tremendous emphasis on prayer, on contemplative prayer, that was what most of the time, I mean, what did we do together? What did we actually do together? We prayed and we ate. And yeah, and there were courses, but the courses were small. You know, you sat, uh, you studied here and you studied there. It was, uh, so it was uh, 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 coming together for, for Shabbos morning, um, and it was only Shabbos and Yontif. We didn't have uh, a morning minion. Uh, people, people could, you know, could go to a morning minion, but it wasn't part of... Uh, and Friday night was just the Chavara, right? Just the numbers. Yeah. Kabbalah, yeah, I guess that it must have been. The reason I'm hesitating is that I didn't attend uh, Kabbalah Shabbat, and, and the reason I remember it is because I lived in the building for the first six months. Mm -hmm. There was one telephone in the kitchen, which was adjacent to the prayer room, and my parents uh, insisted that I call them every Friday night. And as a dutiful son, I would call them every night. And as you can hear from my interview, I talk quite loud, loudly. And at a certain point, very gently, uh, Art came t t to tell me that, you know, we can hear your conversation when we're trying to daven. Maybe you should reschedule your Friday night talk with your parents. So because I remember that, that's how I know that I didn't, I, I didn't go to Kabbalah Shabbat. Okay, so presumably it wasn't an obligatory part of the, of the week that you were sort of, it was optional. Yeah. Can we go back for one minute? I just want to talk about uh, the role the house played. The house was brand new, as you were saying, when, when you came into it in the, in the, in, into the Chabarad in, in the second year. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, was a factor, was a, played a real part in creating this chavura, mm -hmm. sense of community. Yes. Can you talk about the house? What yes. The house itself. Right, Uncle House. So I lived there. Uh, Uncle House to start. I don't know, somebody coined that phrase. You'll have to ask Joel Rosenberg. Uh, he'll remember maybe. Um, one, of this, one of the Steves maybe called it that. Somebody coined this phrase. So first of all, we had a resident cat. Has anyone mentioned the cat? Maybe Joel. Okay, so they called him Krishna Cat. I used to call him Krishma Cat, uh, Kriyachma. Uh, <laughs> but his official name was Krishna Cat. I didn't like cats, so I, and I was allergic to most cats, so I was not partial to him to begin with, and I had to live with him. Or was it a she? I honestly don't know whether it was a he or a she. Um, so one it, m bonding experience was uh, painting the house. And I happened to have saved this unique document, uh, which is all, si I th all sides of the house. Uh, we had to paint it yellow. So they div divvied up, and I'll put this online so you can all see it. Uh, so this is the front of the house, and uh, so what I'm holding in my hand is uh, the uh, outline of all f facades of the building on College Avenue, and how we 
divvied up the responsibilities for painting. So this is the west side facing the street, which is College Ave. And it says here that I'm responsible for section number seven. And here are the instructions. Number seven includes the ceiling, posts, and railings of the porch, and the lattices under it, and the wall where the door is, but not the floor or the steps. And I recognize the handwriting as Joel Rosenberg's, because uh, nobody had as beautiful a, a handwriting as he. So uh, when you visit, uh, I'm very proud of this, uh, when you visit College Ave in the Chavura today, there you will see a um, plaque which says, Ki la Kedosha Chavurat Shalom in Hebrew, Kuf Kuf, Ki la Kedosha, uh, Covenantal Community, Chavurat Shalom. It's uh, the Armenian potter on Via Dolorosa. I commissioned that uh, in the summer of 1969 and uh, brought it back uh, before I think I had actually seen the building because um, we left for the summer after Packard Manson. and we only moved in uh, in, in August. So I probably I, 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 I ordered it during that summer break and brought it back and we affixed it. Uh, so living in the house was and the house itself is very challenging because it was filthy. The place was absolutely filthy. There were reefers everywhere. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had to figure out a rotation. And it took a long time for the rotation to kick in because people came and went and uh, nobody likes to do cleanup. The worst of all was the kitchen. Uh, that was terrible. And I was rooming with the two Steves, Steve Zweibaum and, and Steve Epstein, who weren't the neatest people on earth. They lived in the uh, attic. And you lived where? I lived on the second floor, and they lived on the third floor, which was uh, the three people living there. St um, uh, Richie Siegel had a room up there, and the two Steves, were they sharing a room? They shared a concubine, so uh, her name was Rosie. Uh, and she wasn't Jewish. Um, so I guess they lived in the same room, or I don't know, you'll have to ask them. Uh, <laughs> what was your room like? My room was very neat. Uh, it had no door, uh, so Charles had to build me a door. And, um, and Ruthie Brooks sewed me burlap uh, curtains, because it had no curtains. So the place was pretty run down, um, and the floors creaked. Uh, but it was spacious, and um, so the second floor had my bedroom and had one large classroom, um, as I recall, or it seemed large at the time, and I think that's where the library was, and I've already described the, the main floor. Whether this is still on the walls or not, I don't know, but Mike Swirsky did a calligraphy uh, and was framed on the first floor in the study room, and it read, To be Jewish is to remind the world that we have not yet done with ambiguity. <laughs> Sounds pretty profound, doesn't it? He made that up. <laughs> To be Jewish is to remind the world that we have not yet done with ambiguity. So it, this is 50 years ago and I still remember. Uh, I don't know whether it's still hanging there, but I remember that sign and I know that he did it. Um, so yeah, I mean the, the house was definitely the focal point. It was our, it was our house of study, it was our lair house, it was our shul, it was our shtibel. It was our, the place where we, where we ate our meals. Uh, everything happened in, in the house. Even any meetings happened in the house. Oh, also. the meetings. Oh, yes, around the fireplace, definitely. There was a fireplace. Yes. That I didn't know. Yes. Um, not, whether it was a real fireplace or not, I couldn't say, but there was a fireplace on the first floor. Um, Just as you walked in, yeah. Um, There were, can you talk a little bit about the meetings themselves. A number of people have talked about the intensity of those meetings. Um, yeah. And the challenge of those meetings. Yeah. So first of all, 
the, the, halach, the, the only halachic principle of membership, the only thing you were absolutely required to do is you had to live within a certain circ- parameters of the, the house. Not close enough so that one could visit each other on foot on Shabbos. So you, it wouldn't, you wouldn't have to drive. Um, so that's very important because really what we're doing is re- re- recreating the shtetl where everyone who's important to you lives within walking distance. So the halacha really played into that and, and the house was the epicenter. And remember, Art and Kathy lived across the street. So you, you can't get any closer to the center of sanctity than, than 113 College Avenue and whatever their address was, literally across the street from the Chabura. Meetings um, were very intense because there was a lot of tension. So what we didn't know when we joined uh, the group is that there had already been an, a failed attempt at a covenant that uh, Steph Krieger uh, initiated uh, to draw up a, a, a 10 point covenant that everyone would sign on to. And that went absolutely nowhere. And he can tell the story much better than I because it was on his beat. We never, there, there was, I, I, I re- went through my notes. Someone made a passing reference to it. I think even Jim Kugel, uh, yes, in one of his statements saying that he mentioned a covenant when I, and I didn't even know what it meant that, that when I read it uh, uh, originally. The group um, basically split within the first year. I mentioned that there was a two-tiered membership. Well, that's okay on paper, but in actual fact, it created a lot of tension between those. Originally, it was supposed to be those who were on the rabbinic track, who, who really wanted the, let's say, the Haver degree at the end of the line, and those who had it other, you know, were studying or working during the day, and then studying and praying as and spending as much time as they could. Okay, but it's the first group uh, that wanted the Chavara to be much more than it could be. Uh, they want, and we called, they had a name. And their name was the Dortonians. They lived on the far side of Powderhouse Circle, which in Yiddish is Dorten. They lived Dorten. It must have been me who... who who to- I don't know, because who else would have come up with this? Uh, Dalton means over there. So there are the people who lived over there, Dalton, and they became, in our parlance, the Daltonians. The radical fringe. What was the radical fringe? They wanted the Chavara to be their, uh, their life, and they wanted us to pool our economic resources, and they wanted this to be kind of like an urban kibbutz, and basically a very, very high level of commitment. And the two groups mm, couldn't coexist. So this uh, precipitated a major period of soul searching um, where each of us had to present a position paper. This was suggested by Art as a, one way of yes. working your way towards a solution. I, yes, yes. And in the end, they, it was decided that there wasn't room for, for two disparate visions and that the majority ruled and that Dortonians, if they weren't happy, had to go elsewhere. So what happened? They did. They did, did they go elsewhere or they just sort of... Well, they may have physically stayed. Some, they may have stayed in the... I, you know, uh, when Michael Paley, you could ask him this, when he would come visiting... Those were the people he hung out with. They, they were the ones who he was closest with. Um, if you wanted to find Paley, that's where you would have found him. Um, I think, well, Steph left very early on. Uh, Kogel left. Yeah, I would say probably the ones who, 
the core group uh, ended up leaving. But there was an enormous amount of uh, Sturm und Drang, and I and many of us have complete sets of, uh, of all of these position papers, where, which are extremely interesting and very self-conscious. Um, what did people do in the position papers? Each one enunciated what they wanted from the Chavura, what their personal vision was. Um, some more articulate than others, and some more all-encompassing than others. Some said, we like it the way it is, and you know, we don't want a total environment, and the way things exist today is just is fine, maybe just tweak it. And others said no. So, look, th the whole thing, writ large, was a utopian experiment. Utopian because we were all in our early 20s, uh, there were still no children on the scene. We could in invest all of our psychic energies in this uh, enterprise. And we were reinventing ourselves. And I, I think we all felt that the models of Judaism that we had come from were bankrupt, and everyone for a different reason. We were really leaving Egypt. We were really leaving Europe behind. We were really leaving something behind and entering into this new space, which for us, if this didn't work, it was kind of an all or nothing proposition. There was nothing to go back to. I think that's what most of us felt. There was nothing to go back to. Either we were gonna make this work, or who knows you know, how we would go on living a, a meaningful Jewish life, spiritual life, you know, fill in the blanks. Um, so this exercise of self-definition was uh, was actually very beneficial uh, because it was discreet. It wasn't, you know, defined as an existential uh, assignment. Don't, you don't have to write about your whole life. You're just writing about the thing itself. What do you want the Chavara to be? Um, and it turned out that there were many, very many disparate uh, ideas and levels that people were aspiring to. But you know, essentially it was this, this moment in time. The, the meetings uh, were difficult. And, it, and the, what made it difficult is that after a while, you could anticipate what anyone was going to say. And I have to say that this has been the bane of my existence all through the subsequent decades. Because all the, you know, I, I belong to a spin-off of, uh, of the Chavara. Uh, meetings are the least uh, enjoyable. It's precisely for this reason, because you know, you already know in advance basically what every person around the table is going to say. But the group process dictates that you have to hear, everyone has to be heard from. It's very time consuming because there is no leadership model. Uh, it's a leaderless group, at least theoretically. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to go into this whole question of, you know, art's role as wanting to be the Rebbe, not wanting to be the Rebbe. That's a very complicated issue that I, I don't really want to uh, address. But certainly, no one, there wasn't anybody to say, okay, now that's it. We've, you know, that, enough is, we've said it all, let's, let's take a vote. I don't even remember ever taking a vote on anything, frankly. I don't even know how things were decided. It was all process. It was all process. I don't even know, I, don't rem I may be missing something. Um, but it wasn't as if, let's take a vote and decide to, reje to, to reject the, the Dortonians. Everybody in favor raise their hand. I, I don't think we ever had anything like that. Because it was a consensus model. Basically. Yes, totally. The other episode, which I should mention, because uh, it had very profound personal repercussions, very painful, leaving aside th this whole issue, uh, we had one encounter group. We had a facilitated encounter group where we actually brought in someone from the outside because it was felt that we couldn't handle this by ourselves and maybe an outside intervention would 
change the, uh, you know, would alleviate matters. It was an all-day affair, and in the, early, in the first part, the before lunch part, they did this exercise where the group leader placed Art in the center of the room. And he sat him down on the floor, and everyone was supposed to position themselves on the floor where they th thought they were vis-a-vis -vis Art. Let's see what it looks like. How do you envisage who's in and who's out? Okay, so th we did that. Then, you know, in the name of openness, things were said which should never have been said. Um, and the person who was hurt the most was the woman I was married to at the time, Dina, who is, was probably the only one in the room who knew how these groups worked uh, because she had been Abraham Maslow's last student at de Brandeis and had written her master's thesis on these kinds of group dynamics and what group are, therapy. What are encounter groups? Can you just describe what that is, what it was meant to be? Well, it's supposed to be a controlled environment where you let your, your unspoken feelings out. And because it's controlled, um, it, the anger and resentments then are supposed to be rechanneled and and, it, and at the end of the day, the group will come back together again. But unless you articulate, or, or as I just mentioned, you actually physically embody what the problems are, and you see that some people see themselves as insiders and outsiders, uh, unless you actually see it, in fact, you can't call it anything, and you don't even know what the issues are. So, you know, it's a very 60s kind of model, it's also kind of group process, but it's supposed to be uh, much more uh, controlled and um, manageable. Well, uh, Dina ended up provoking people, asking them about what they thought about her. And so all the bad things that they thought about her came out. And, well, she never came back for the afternoon session. And that was almost, that was close to the breaking point where we ended up leaving the Chavara much earlier than I had intended. Um, it had other far-reaching repercussions, which I would only understand much later. Uh, it was very unfortunate. Uh, she should have come back. The, th the things that were said shouldn't have been said. I mean, if we had to do it over again, uh, I would rewind the whole thing and, and start and maybe never have had the, the whole damn thing to begin with. Yes, if I had to live my life over again, it would have been better if we hadn't had this. Uh, because people who came back in the afternoon said that, yeah, that in fact, uh, the group did uh, you know, reconstitute itself and there were good feelings at the end of the day. It was never repeated. We never had another encounter group, so obviously people felt maybe this wasn't such a good idea and, and whatever differences we had, we should resolve in a different way. Uh, but it's an index of how much tension there was that we, we used, we turned to kind of desperate measures. And to bring in someone from the outside uh, was, was, a, was a pretty radical thing to, to do. Um, my fond memories of the Wednesday nights uh, around the campfire, uh, so, so to speak, uh, is that you could also let your hair down. And that's one of the sources of entertainment, which I remember, is those who were seminary graduates regaling us with stories about their teachers at JTS and what a horrific place it was. And it was hilarious because they used to do riffs on their teachers. Uh, and they were so successful that when I ended up joining the seminary faculty, I recognized all of the people by the parodies that had been made of them uh, around the, the fireplace at Chavarat Shalom. I knew exactly who each person was because they got it exactly right. 
So, you know, it wasn't all just uh, tedium. Um, also, uh, you remember this. We were catapulted to fame instantaneously. Uh, the Jewish community thought that we were the answer and was just and seized upon the Chavorah as, as something extraordinary. So people kept flocking to us uh, to meet us and to visit the Chavorah. How did they know about the uh, It was in the paper. I mean, I think there was even Time, even Time Magazine had, had something about us. We were in the news. Uh, uh, Shabtai Tevet, who was the leading journalist from Haaretz, came and did this huge article about us um, uh, in, in, in Haaretz. Uh, so these, some of these meetings were, one I remember in particular, Richard Rubenstein, a very notable, you know, a, a theologian, and came to visit uh, just because he wanted to see who, who we were. And at the end of which, he said, I rem and this is what I remember him saying, you know, these Hasidim that you're so enamored of, they did observe all the mitzvot. It, <laughs> I just want you to remember, they really were observant Jews. For all the things that you ascribe to them, don't forget. <laughs> mm. So I remember thinking, hmm, he's right, you know. Uh, they weren't all sitting around smoking pot all the time and, and doing these other crazy things, even though we imagine ourselves in their, in their image. Um, so uh, meetings, I, uh, it was unfortunate. It was an unfortunate but necessary part of, uh, of belonging. And they were very long and repetitive and... Um, Would you say overall that the meetings did succeed in bringing people closer as a community and creating the community? No. The meetings, no. The meetings were, were n never that. But they... Th th what brought us together uh, was going out on retreats, was doing other stuff together, was uh, prayer. Thank goodness that we had all the other activities. Meetings, I, um, I don't remember leaving a meeting with a good feeling and saying, oh, now uh, I feel this great sense of relief and yes, and now we'll forge ahead. And um, We did... I mean, certain things needed to be discussed. We created an, uh, uh, a lair house, right? So you had to meet in order to dis decide what we were... This was, <laughs> it sounds funny, our idea of outreach. Because this was very solipsistic. We were doing all of this for ourselves. We were hoarding all of this. And we understood. We, we owed something to the community at large. So what could we give back? Okay, so this is what we gave back, in my time anyway. This is the program that, of the first year of courses. Um, and the preamble was written by Joel Rosenberg. And it's all based on Franz Rosenzweig and the Lairhouse. Because among the models of the usable past, was not just Hasidism, but also Franz Rosenzweig and, and the German Lehrhaus. So I'll come back to that in, in a second. And here are the courses. Uh, Joey Reamer's Ethical Issues in the Biblical Narrative, Art Green, God and Man in Classical Judaism, Seymour Epstein, Ways into a Jewish Text, Everett Gendler, Three Seasonal Scrolls. That's very interesting. I never thought of that before, but he was our nature man, so it stands to reason that he would teach a course on three seasonal scrolls. It's very funny. David Roski's Yiddish Literature and Translation, my first bona fide course in Yiddish that I ever taught to a, a general public, was at the Chavara. And Joel Rosenberg, Modern Jewish Thought, The Self-Image. So the Lairhouse was for the public, yes. not, not for the... Yes, not for us. We, not for us. Um, I, I, it was for adults, although I remember Haverim uh, being part of my Yiddish literature course. So, was so this, this was in addition to the courses? Yeah, the this was an addition. This was an addition. Yeah, yeah. This was an add-on. Where, where I think. What year was this? Um, do you know? 
Well, I left in 71, so it's probably 70 or 71. It, oh, it says 70, 71. 70, 71. Yeah, okay. so there's no guesswork here. Year. You're second year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And year three. And there is a $50 tuition per person. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we charged money, but it wasn't obviously not a money-making venture. So this was our outreach. So obviously you needed a meeting to discuss to vote on whether we were going to do this and what constituted outreach um, and to plan uh, retreats and when are we going to go out on retreat. Remember, going out on retreat meant that we left the place high and dry so that there was not going to be a service right, right for anyone to go to. There's, there's no backup. When the Chavara leaves, it leaves. There's nothing there. The room is empty. Okay. Um, but those kinds of communal decisions also got made there. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, let's come back to Tefillah, which uh, okay. is, uh, again, absolutely central to what was positive and uplifting for most people mm-hmm. about um, their time in, in the Havara. Um, uh I'd like you to talk a little bit about the silence and the role of silence um, in the service uh, when you first came and how you, how you personally encountered it and felt about it. I found it to be very isolating. I, I felt that there were... It created a spiritual hierarchy. The people who who could meditate and the people who couldn't. And meditation was a very private matter. Some people would actually meditate and cover their heads with a talus, for example. So they were, you know, shutting out the world. And that wasn't a viable model for me. That's not what tefillah was. Um, It seemed inimical. I had, look, there were people who had gone and spent time in uh, monasteries and, you know, with, pe- with fathers who had taken vows of silence and they were very attracted to that as a, as a spiritual model. It wasn't me. I wasn't among them and I wouldn't, uh, that was not a direction I, I, I would have gone. Um, so I didn't, know what to do with the silence. I had never trained in meditation. I had never done yoga. I wasn't interested in Eastern religions. I didn't come to Judaism via Eastern religions. It, it, it exerted no, it, uh, no interest, uh, even to this day. How big a factor was silence in the service? When, did, uh, when was there silence? Uh, the Shabbos morning began with medica- meditation. Shabbos morning began with meditation. So you could come at any point. You didn't have to be there for the meditation, but the first thing you did was to meditate. That's how it began. And then whoever was the shaliyah tzibor would start a nigan, I think. And that would signal how that we were actually beginning. But I, here's a good example of something that for, was very memorable and meaningful. Richie Siegel came up with this. And he was big. In, he was a very big meditator, and uh, this was on a retreat where, when uh, we walked in a, a retreat center we'd never been at, the room was empty, and it was carpeted, and we were instructed to lie down on the ground, on our backs. By Richie. Yes, he was the shaliyah tzibur, he was in charge. And to spread out, there was so much room, uh, to spread out that you could only touch the tips of the fingers of the person next to you, so that you knew that there was someone on either side, uh, but that you could just sort of touch them and know that they were there. So you were alone, but you were not alone. And I think you're supposed to close your eyes. So, okay, so it started with, 
you know, breathing exercises. Okay. But then there was a purpose to it. He was going someplace with that. And, and, and where he was going was this. Um, we began humming and, and uh, disparate notes and notes coming from different places in the room Let's, to see whether the voices could somehow come together. From there, we graduated to syllables. And the syllables were, and this is where he was going with this, were ne, 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 sha, 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 ma, 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 ne, sh, sha, ma, ne, sha, ma. Uh, which, which eventually became the first line of the, of, of the song, kol ha neshama. But the idea was whether, and he may even have articulated it, is that neshama is the same root as neshima, which is breath. Okay, so that was profound. That is, with each breath, we are praising you, O Lord. Neshama, with each breath. Nishama and our breath. Okay, so if one of the ideas of uh, Hasidism, which is very abstract, is avodah begashmiyut, that you're supposed to do your, the holy work, uh, your avodah, with your whole body, and that it must involve the body and it must involve all parts of your body, then that was an object lesson in, in what that could mean. And I actually have adopted that ever since. Not that we can do breathing exercises in Minyan Ma'at because people would think this is totally off the wall. But uh, before Nishmat Kol Chai, uh, I'm, still, I'm the only one who still does this. I say there is a long-standing tradition in the Minyan, and then of course everyone starts laughing because it's only long-standing because I keep insisting on doing it, <laughs> is that before we do Nishmat Kol Chai, we take a deep breath. And let's all take a deep breath, because Nishmat Kol Chai and Nishima are one and the same. And this all goes back to that breathing exercise uh, that Richie Siegel did on a retreat. So I was with him completely, from beginning to end, and I, you know, the Chavarah is the only place on earth that I think that idea would have happened. Certainly the only place on earth that I, David Roskies, would have participated in that kind of tefillah. And it was meaningful. I mean, I learned something about, about davening from that. Can you describe your own debut as the Baal Tefillah? Yeah, um, it wasn't great. <laughs> I, I was on a very steep learning curve. Um, this was your first year? Uh, yeah, yeah, and I think it was Rosh Chodesh or, or even a holiday or even Sukkot or something because I didn't realize that there were changes that had to be made. Yeah, I think it was probably one of the, the, the sec, I don't know, it was, it was during Sukkot or something. I, so Larry Lofman taught me the ropes, and I remember sitting with him, and and the, and it was very technical. You know, where do you sign off? Where do you? I mean, the, really, the basic basics. Uh, I hardly knew anything. The other th the thing I, sh I should also mention is that I was really faking it because I started davening Ashkenaz, and I didn't know what the hell I was doing because I had not learned. Havarash Genazit. I went to a school where we learned Hebrew, Havarash Faradit. It's the only Hebrew that I knew. I knew the Hebrew that was merged into Yiddish, but that's not, you know, there are lots of words that are of Hebrew extraction that you pronounce differently in Yiddish. Uh, but that's not the same as knowing how to daven Ashkenazis. So I made it up. And I didn't really know what I was doing. 
Uh, so I would constantly be putting the accent in the wrong places. And, but it sounded, it felt to me like this is what I needed to do because if Hasidism was the master metaphor, then davening Sephardic was inauthentic. Okay, was so... Was there a general uh, sort of consensus about which way to daven? Hmm, I don't know. Where did I pick this up? You know, I don't know. Certainly Mike Swirsky wouldn't daven that way. Which way? Uh, uh, Ashkenazi. There's no... He would have davened the uh, Sephardi the same way that he did all his life. He wouldn't have switched. Maybe I picked it up from art. Cer ah, maybe from Reb Zalman. Certainly Reb Zalman. That's, that I know for sure, because that's the way he spoke English. He spoke Ashkenazic English. <laughs> I mean, that, his whole language was Ashkenaz. Uh, did art dove in that way? I don't remember, but certainly I got it from Reb Zalman, and maybe that's where I, when I decided, okay, to be, to be authentically Yiddish and be Hasidic, I have, this is something I have to do. Okay, so that was fake. And I didn't pull it off very well because I was making it up and I didn't even know what the rules were. Um, so I was very nervous and I sort of got through it. Look, the important thing is there was a, a, an amazing tolerance level. I have to say, today, the person I am today would not tolerate the person that I was then. As, as no a, way, uh, no way would I have been able to sit in a room with me as a 20-year-old leading the davening. I would have, I'd say, oh, I'd say what, are, what is he doing? He doesn't know what he's doing. How could he get up? What chutzpah? But, but, I ha but the ethos was really followed, um, and, and with the one exception of, you know, Art getting up and walking out on, on Mike Swirsky because he didn't like the... It's not that he was davening wrong, it's just that it wasn't sufficiently spiritual. Uh, I'll give you an ex another example. And in your case, though, Art actually intervened. Right? He did. He just, he, yeah, he just, no, he, with a sing-song, he said, you know, on Yontev, you should do it this way. Uh, I, I see you're really supposed to have started here, but all right, uh, we'll cut you a little bit of slack. Uh, that was wonderful. It was very beautiful. But, um, and I did amazingly funny things. I mean, uh, I, um, we daven from the Birenbaum uh, Siddur, which was Sfardi, Nusach Sfard. Why? For two reasons. One is we got them for free uh, from a shoal that no longer needed them. B, because Hasidim daven Nusach Sfard. So it, ser it served a double purpose. Because um, they all did, you know, the, going back to the Baal Shem Tov, but probably going back even earlier to the, 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 the Kabbalists would, would, would daven Nusach Sfard. Uh, so I once sang the footnotes. I chanted the footnotes. <laughs> I figured if we... Zalman taught us that you can daven in English and that you can chant in English. That was a major breakthrough. He was the great innovator. I mean, what, whatever we learned, we learned from him, not from art. Uh, Zalman was the master. So you could chant in English, you could daven in English. So I thought, okay, if you can chant in English, why can't... Then, all, then everything is holy. Then the footnotes are holy. So let's chant the footnotes. So I did. Uh, you could do that. You could do whatever you wanted. Uh, you could have a, a silent, you could do the whole thing in silence. You could do, you, uh, I, I, I remember on ba Bach's birthday, we played the Brandenburg Concerto instead of davening Chakras. Um, it was fantastic. And you had to trust uh, the Baltvilla. You had to trust the Baltvilla. So when the group was still small enough, uh, it, was, it, it was obeyed, strictly obeyed. The first woman, and I would like to go on record, because uh, this is not written down anywhere, the first woman who led a service at the Chavara was my former wife, Dina. Uh, she too was not at all prepared for the task, but she wanted to do it. And she did some very interesting things with, with mo movement and body. 
Uh, her Hebrew wasn't very good. <laughs> she made a lot of mistakes. But I have to hand it to her. It was very gutsy to get up in front of that group and uh, lead a service uh, and try to do something feminine as well. Remember also, the whole feminist thing was just, just beginning to, yes. to surface. We weren't, we weren't all that... Uh, we weren't uh, that uh, ahead of the game there. I think we, had a lot, um, we needed a lot of prompting. Art Green called it a pre-feminist moment. I think I would say that's exactly right. Yeah. So do you recall women um, wearing talesi, for instance? Mm, yeah. But it, so there were the imahot, I would call them. I mean, Janet and uh, Janet Holtz was already someone who was very spiritual. And you could see that she had there was a special aura about her. Um, some of the other women were simply spouses. Um, um, Bella Saverin wasn't interested in prayer per se, and it wasn't her thing, it was George's thing. Uh, Eva Epstein, absolutely not for her. Uh, and made, she made it very clear that she thought we were a bunch of babies and we were just play acting, and she let us know it in no uncertain terms. Um, I think there were already women uh, davening in, in Talaisin. Um, I did tell the story, but I, I heard this, this is secondhand, I, I don't remember myself, of how women were counted in the Minyan. Do you have that on tape? Uh, okay, I think that's actually quite interesting. It had happened ad hoc. Um, it happened at a Sukkot retreat, so it must have been very early on. We were about to go home, and Epi said he had Yortzeit the next day for his mother. He wanted to organize a minion. Were there 10 people who would raise their hand and whom he could count on to have a morning minion the next day. And nine, nine chaverim raised their hand. And either Mona raised her hand or asked whether she could raise her hand. Maybe she raised her hand. Uh, anyway, it was Mona Fishbay who called the question, will you accept me for the minion or will you not accept? So uh, let's say that there were 10 hands, but one of them were a woman, and he said, well, we don't have a minion. And she, and I'm making this up, but let's say that she said, well, why don't you want to count me as the minion? At which point he said, you're right. And that's when it was decided and the precedent was created then. That's, With discussion? Or? No. 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 Nope. And that's very chavura. That's a, an authentic moment, without a discussion. That's real. That's a real moment, where the precedent happened, halacha l'ma'aseh, and it made perfect sense. I also, I actually researched this. Um, there's a backstory. Uh, the earliest time where a woman was actually called up to the Torah was for an oifruf. So this must have been really at the very beginning, probably still on in Cambridge, uh, where whoever was the shaliach tzibur decided if they're both, if there's an oifruf, they should both be called up. And whose oifruf was it? Do you remember? Uh, no, I wasn't there. Uh, someone will remember. Maybe Steph will remember. Um, someone, somebody's, if you jog their memories. So that's the first time that a woman was called up to the Torah, which broke certain, you know, obviously broke certain taboos. Uh, but a woman counted for the minion, that was the first time. And it was Mona who called the question. And it was, and it's interesting because uh, Epi is, you know, was not a radical. But that, that was an authentic response. Once you were a member of this group, that's, that was the right thing to do. If he had remained you know, what he had been, if he wasn't open to change, he had no business being there. Had there been dissent, had certain members dissented, even without 
saying anything in that moment. Would that kind of an issue, would the issue of women's status and roles have been discussed? Yes, definitely. We had a discussion whether women, yes, it was uh, on a Wednesday, you know, uh, it was a meeting, uh, an agenda item, whether women individually could count, become members, not as spouses. And, and it was voted and the answer was yes. I was there for that. I, I, I would have to go through my notes, uh, but yes, it happened very early on where there was a case of somebody who wanted to apply for membership as a single woman, not as anybody's spouse, and we had to decide whether to consider it, and it was voted on. Yeah. What about so this contradicts what I said before, that no decisions were ever made. Uh, yes, decisions were made. What about women's roles in, in public worship? So I just said, it, there was never... A vote. On that De or anything? You're no. Dina got up one Shabbos morning and led the service. Period. That was it. There was never a discussion about whether she could or she couldn't. She was a member. If she wanted to do it, it was her right to do it. Based on the principle that whatever the Shaliyah Tzibur, wherever the Shaliyah Tzibur took you, that's where you had to be willing to go. So she w was she a member by virtue of the fact that she was your wife? Yes. She, yes. She was a member. But yes. This yes. Status yes, that women yeah, have. she snuck in through the back door, yes. Mm -hmm. She didn't have to go through the whole rigmarole that I did. Right, which, okay, so, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, let's turn to study and learning. Um, uh, all right. But, um, well, uh, wait, I want to back up. I'm not, sure. I'm not finished yet with, ah, okay. with this Hasidic thing. Yes. Because uh, there's one more crucial story to go, and that's the Kotsk. I have to tell you the story of, I have to memorialize the story of Kotsk, how this song became the anthem of Chavarat Shalom, and it is. Uh, it's the closest thing that we have to an anthem. So, uh, I mentioned earlier that records, you know, and uh, mechanical means of reproduction were our source for a lot of stuff, because where else would we learn it? None of us grew up in a Hasidic home. None of, you know, if we went, let's say, to the Boston or Rebbe or something like that, or spent a weekend with the Lubavitcher in, in 770 Eastern Parkway. But basically, nobody really knew what Hasidism was other than through reading. But we had these records, and the records were the first, that, that was extremely important. And Ben Sion Schenker, who just died, uh, was writing new melodies all the time. So it wasn't just archival. The Hasidic revival was happening w w dur on our beat, and new, new records and new nigunim were, were coming to the surface and being written. Uh, okay. So I knew this song from a record. I knew this song from a record, uh, a Ruth Rubin record. And it's funny, because I'm mentioning this because I could have learned it from its source. The source was a man whose name was Jacob Zipper, whom I knew. He was the principal of the rival Yiddish school called the Parrot School, not the one that I went to. I went to the Volksschule. He was the principal of the Parrot School. He came from a town called Tishovitz, which was a Hasidic town. Ruth Rubin, uh, one of the earliest Jewish ethnomusicologists, was also a Montrealer. And she recorded this song from him, uh, of him singing it. I never heard that recording, but on one of her records, one of my favorites, which I would listen to over and over and over and over again, she sings this song a cappello. Um, and I'll, I'll sing it at the end of when I finish the story. So I love this song, and you know, it's probably one of the, the conduits that at, through the song is also, come to think of it, how I end up at the Chavarat Shalom, because all of these things create a, a, a longing, an urging, a, a longing for something. Um, you want to be inside that material. Uh, like watching the Dibbuk, which I saw over and over and over again. I wanted to be in that movie. I wanted to be there among them. I didn't want to be watching the movie. I wanted to be in it. I wanted to be those people. And the song uh, always spoke to me. 
So um, the first winter of the Chavura, so this must be already uh, December, I, I joined in August, so it must have been December 69, pretty early. Uh, my parents went off to Israel, to, my brother Ben had gone on Aliyah, and they left the house to me, a very big house in Montreal, 13-room house, uh, on a hill. So I, I issued an open invitation, which I still have, to all Haverim who wanted to spend their week, winter vacation in Montreal, with, and I gave them driving instructions. The only person I think who took me up on it was Joel Rosenberg who ended up driving up to Montreal um, and joining me. And according to his journal, I even left him there. I went to the annual uh, Jugendruf conference in New York, and he basically lived in the house all by himself. So he must have been the only person who took me up on it. Okay. Um, he arrives, and there is this fantastic snowstorm. I mean, a uh, historic uh, blizzard. And he's from California. He'd never seen so much snow his entire life. He was just, he wasn't dressed for it, but he was just exhilarated. And we were homebound. There was no place to go. They hadn't cleaned the streets yet. <laughs> it was still coming down. So I was thinking, what the hell are we going to do? This is before DVDs and before anything. You know, we have a whole night ahead of us. So I said, you know what, you're interested in Yiddish, and he, and he was, and he was, he was writing poetry in Yiddish, and we were discovering Yiddish poetry together. He was not only my chaver, but he was also my Talmud. Um, I said, you know, a very famous Yiddish poet lives not too far away. Her name is Rochel Korn. I'll call her up, and if she's home, we'll walk over. So I called her up, and I said, Rochel, I have somebody I'd really like to introduce you to. He's uh, studying Yiddish and he's a poet. Would you like to meet him? She said, of course. Why don't you come over? So if it hadn't been snowing, it would have been a 15-minute walk. This was like a half an hour, a 40-minute walk. We were trudging up. And as we were walking up the, the hill, at the beginning, just we had just started trekking through. There was no traffic. It was All the streets were closed. There was feet of snow and the snow was still coming down. I thought... What this occasion needs is a pilgrimage song. <laughs> so I said, I'm going to sing you a, a song, in Yona de Yoma, something that, you know, about Kotsk, about you don't drive to Kotsk, you go on foot, because uh, Kotsk is doch bim koim hamigdish. Kotsk is in, in place of the migdish, or the place of the base hamigdish. You have to go on foot. And the... And the way I, that I remembered the song is very easy to remember because every stanza plays on the meaning of regel. So the first stanza says, regel is der teich afis, means you have to go by foot. Regel means lehit ragel, you have to get into the habit of going to Kotsk. And regel means holiday. And whenever you go to Kotsk, it's a holiday. So I sang him the song. Kakohotsk fort menisht, Kakohotsk geit men, weil Kotsk is doch bim koima migdesh, Kotsk is doch bim koima migdesh, Kakotsk darf men oile regelzan, oile regelzan, regel is doch der teitscha fies. Kakotsk darf man gein zu fies, oi singen dik und tanzen dik und das gsidim gein Kakotsk geit men am mita tanz und das gsidim gein Kakotsk geit men am mita tanz. So, let me read you Joel Rosenberg's absolutely brilliant translation of uh, the Kotsk song, okay? Uh, which appears at the very end of my chapter called Kotz, the chapter that I wrote about Chavarat Shalom. So this is Joel's translation. To Kotz, one does not ride. To Kotz, one goes on foot. For Kotz is now in place of the temple. Kotz is now in place of the temple. To Kotz, one must make a pilgrimage. Make a pilgrimage. Regel, you know, is the word for foot. To Kotz, one must travel on foot, singing out and dancing about. And when Hasidim go forth to Kotz, they go there with a dance. And when Hasidim go forth to Kotsk, they go there with a dance. 
Regal, you know, is the word for habit. One must make a habit of going to Kotsk, singing out and dancing about, and when Hasidim go forth to Kotsk, they go there with a dance. And when Hasidim go forth to Kotsk, they go there with a dance. And then the resounding last stanza is, Regal, you know, is the word for Yontif. Good Yontif, good Yontif, good Yontif, good Yontif. Singing out and dancing about, and when Hasidim go forth to Kotsk, they go there with a dance, and when Hasidim go forth to Kotsk, it's a major Yontif. So I can't tell you with any degree of precision when we brought this back uh, to the group. It could have been most likely for a Sudash Lishit uh, soon thereafter. And we always sing this song when we get together. To this day. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, George Savrin will do the, well, there are a couple of people who can do the harmony. George is very good at the harmony. Uh, Art will sing off key, because that's his won't, uh, but with a great deal of passion. So why did this become? So let's just stop for a minute. Uh, why did this become the, the anthem? Um, here are my thoughts on this. It's a Hasidic song, and it's a real uh, authentic uh, pilgrimage song. And I, a reason I underscore that is that most of the Yiddish songs that are supposedly Hasidic are really anti-Hasidic. They're spoofs, they're parodies. But people, they're so good at parodying that people have forgotten that they were really created f to make fun of the whole movement. This is not one of them. Um, so, it's the real thing. Secondly, it's who we are. Uh, this group, we were pilgrims. We were all pilgrims. We were on a journey. Thirdly, it has this very radical refrain. Very radical, which is, and there are two ways of reading it, but either way, Kotsk, why are we going on pilgrimage to Kotsk? Because Kotsk is bimkoim hamigdish, which either means the place of the temple or in place of the temple, because bimkoim could be in, to replace the temple. But let's even um, let's even allow that it is the place of a temple, of and, and not to replace it. That means that where the Rebbe is is our temple. There is no question that f for me and for many of my chaverim, uh, that's what uh, the Chavura was. That's what uh, 113 College Avenue was. It was our temple, and it was the most sacred place while we were there and while we were creating uh, this, this thing called the Chavura. It was the spiritual center of our lives. So why not sing about it? Why not sing about it? And, and then the question comes up, well, what about Israel? We haven't talked about Israel. Many of us uh, spend time in Israel, would end up going to Israel, moving to Israel, trying to live in Israel, coming back from Israel. So can one say that this ramshackle wooden building on, in Somerville, Massachusetts is in place of all of that? And the answer is yes, as, as strange as it may seem, yes, because that's, you know, that, that spiritual business becomes your, the end all and be all. You're willing to give it everything. And you've changed your, and it's changed, it's transformed your whole understanding of your place in the world. So, and you take that with you. It's a movable temple, right? You don't have to be in that place. After all, you can, you know, create other chavorot. Um, but that's, if that's the moment. Um, the, that Kotsk represents that possibility in your life. Kotsk represents that possibility of creating a utopian space, uh, which is the sum total of all your aspirations, of everything that you would want life to be and, and your future to look like. And it's not, 
sustainable. But if you've lived it, even for a year, or in my case, two years, uh, it creates a hunger that will never, never leave you. You're always looking for it again. That, to me, is, is, the, is the core of it, right? That once you've been in that, in that place, um, you're going to want to recreate it. And no place will ever measure up to it because you're never that young again and you're never that unencumbered again. And, you know, the, the stars will never be perfectly aligned again. But since you've already been there once, you're always hoping that you can recapture that again. And that's very powerful. That spiritual hunger that never leaves you, that's, uh, I hope I don't lose that. That's what I learned in, in those two years. And that's what the Kotsk song represents to me. It could mean something very different to other people who sing it. Uh, but that's what, what it means. I was there. I was in Kotsk. I, and look, even the pilgrims have to go home. The, they visit with the Rebbe and then they go back to where they came from. But they've been there. They visited the Rebbe. And here's the song to prove it. Here's the song to prove it. We were there. Okay, we're going, we're going to spend the last segment of our time together basically reflecting on mm-hmm. the meaning of Chavra as you've just started to talk about um, mm-hmm. with Kotz, Kotzk song, um, both in your own life, but in a, in a larger way. Um, on, on American Jewry and Jewry in general. So I want to start by asking you, you were actively engaged as a member of Chavarat Shalom from 1969 to 71. Uh, why did you decide to leave at that point and to do what? It had to do with Israel. Um, it had to do with uh, deciding that there was an alternative to Kotsk, and that was the state of Israel, and that was being, that was the other more in, compelling experiment that was happening uh, out there. Um, it had to do with the fact that in 1971, uh, my wife and I were sent to the Soviet Union as part of this extraordinary organized effort uh, on the part of uh, the Israeli government, a secret arm of the Israeli government, uh, to send uh, American Jews, European Jews, but primarily American Jews, to the Soviet Union to keep up the contact. And uh, uh, Dina and I were there for a month in uh, 1971, and that was life-changing. That was absolutely a transformative event. Um, the Jews of Silence, uh, you know, had already come out of uh, Elie Wiesel, but to step back into that world and to meet the people, uh, the first refuseniks and the, what was happening, the revival of Jewish life in the Soviet Union and the beginning of the hope of, of Aliyah to Israel, we were just on fire. And this was my world after all. This was Eastern Europe. These were the Jews that I knew about it, but we had written them off. Um, It was like walking into history. Really, literally walking into history. So we came back and we threw all of our energies into into the Soviet Jewry movement. And the Chavara wasn't with us. They weren't with us. This was not their thing. Not their thing. Was it painful? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, that was, yeah. It was. So that's when I began to f- realize that you know, my, w- I was going to leave sooner or later. Uh, we had already made plans to go on Aliyah. I mentioned earlier that these plans were uh, speeded up because of what had happened. And we decided we'd rather leave now than wait out the, the whole calendar year, so we left in the middle of the year. But it was already in our, you know, the, the plan was to move to, to Israel. Mm-hmm. Um, and it seemed like an either-or proposition. You know, you could either stay in the Chavara and build your spiritual life here, or go into Israel and, and start uh, over again. So um, I was still in, uh, in the middle of writing my... Uh, I'd just begun to work on my dissertation. I could do that anywhere. 
In fact, uh, I'd be, be easier for me to be working at the Hebrew University Library than uh, anywhere else. So we left. We went. It was very abrupt. There was very abrupt and uh, it was kind of, for me personally, an open wound that didn't heal for a long, long, long time. I was not ready to leave yet. I had not finished what I had started out to do. But that's what happened. So what was your involvement with uh, sort of the development of Havarot and the Havara movement over the ensuing years? I spent the rest of my life uh, looking for surrogates. So uh, uh, Israel, it, it didn't last, you know, we didn't even last the, the full three years. We came back. Um, and pretty soon after returning to New York, I got it, well, I came back. The irony of, of history is that I was offered a job by the very same Jewish theological seminary um, that we had spent our evenings making fun of. And that's because of an extraordinary individual named Gerson D. Cohen, who was on the, the, the greatest uh, hiring spree in the history of, of higher Jewish education. He was reinventing the seminary and turning it into a school of, uh, of a university, a Jewish university. Uh, and my resume landed on his desk at just the right time. Um, he wanted to expand in all areas, and one of the areas that was lacking uh, was my area of expertise, Yiddish uh, literature. There was nobody he, whom he could have hired among his own students for the simple reason that Yiddish was anathema uh, at the seminary. It was not taught, it was, not, it was considered to beyond the pale, and he wanted that. And uh, basically he hired me, um, and I've been there ever since. So, uh, and pretty s within two years of being here, I bump into Alan Mintz, and he says, you know, there's this minion that's been created. It's a, it's a floating minion. It meets in private homes. Uh, it's this very small group, and pretty soon, we're, be we're gonna close the membership. So if you want in, now's the time. <laughs> So uh, I was interested because he said, you'll, rec you'll know everybody. It's like, you'll, you know, it'll be like old times. And uh, I was looking, uh, I had been going to a shtibol trying the other route, trying to pretend that I was really a chassid. In Jerusalem? No, here in New York, here in, on the Upper West Side. I went to a, a Hasidic shtibol and I thought that would be my shul because they spoke Yiddish and... Uh, it was not successful. It was not at all successful. And so uh, the timing was just right. I, I was looking for something else. And uh, I joined the, uh, this thing that was really Minyan Ma'at. It was very, very small. It was barely 20 people at the time. Uh, and then I've been at, you know, I've been part of all the, the permutations of the group and active in it uh, until very, till, till now. And I must also say, apropos the hunger, uh, stilling one's spiritual hunger, the minion that I have found that is closest uh, uh, on the face of this earth, closest to Chavarat Shalom, as I remember it, is a minion in Jerusalem called the Leader Minion, named after the family leader, that's their family name. Uh, they only meet once a month on Shabbos Mevorchim, and uh, the service is, lasts five hours, and uh, it's amazing. It's what is amazing? Amazing is that you sing every word, that uh, Psuke de Zimra takes two and a half hours, uh, that it's, these are not born again Hasidim, but they're, they're new age Hasidim, but they really are very knowledgeable, and they know exactly what they're doing. Uh, it's this one family called the leader, the leaders, and uh, one of them is actually uh, Evan is in Boston and teaches for uh, is a mainstay of the Hebrew College. He's one of the rabbinical school, right? And uh, his uncle is the one who uh, leads this, 
the leader minion in, in Jerusalem. And when, as soon as I walked in there, I knew I was home and that this is what I was missing, that level of intensity where davening is the most important thing you could possibly do in your whole life. You wouldn't want to do anything else but daven. A little over a year ago, um, fall of 2015, you gave um, a lecture, the Rowitowitz Lecture at Brandeis, entitled Chavarat Shalom, a Utopian Experiment, in which you described the Chavara as, quote, a combination ashram, monastery, shtibol, lairhouse, and urban kibbutz that drew its inspiration from far and wide. Why, when looking back, and on all the things we've discussed, do you see the change in the way Jews related to davening as the most profound change wrought by the Chavara? That was the most uh, neglected area. I mean, it's the bane of everyone's existence. I mean, it's the one thing that American Judaism didn't, did not, uh, it just, it, it, run, it ran up against a, a, a brick wall. Um, so we started over and we started small. I think that was a key insight, a key insight. You can't daven in, in a, a temple. It's not a place for davening. It's for something else. It's for worship. Uh, you can bring sacrifices in a temple, but you certainly can't daven. Uh, you need a small, intimate uh, space. So, uh, we, literally, we had to begin at the beginning. Uh, in a room, uh, a crowded uh, space, bring people into that space. And to rethink what a sacred space is, remember, I mean, so sitting on the floor might seem very hokey, but if that's a spiritual language, then you have to try it. You have to try whatever works. See, you know, try different ways of... Uh, of expressing your religious personality. So um, the pieces are, are actually, uh, they're movable parts. The, the, the tefillah is one of them. The Dvar Torah is also, we haven't even spoken about that. A whole new, the Chavarad developed a real, a whole new paradigm for what it means to give a Dvar Torah. How, how you can make the texts, the Torah, your own. How, what do you do? How, what, what are the interpretive tools? What, what's, what are the limits? So we learned from the masters. People like, you know, list, uh, Art, who lives inside these texts, but speaks with, you know, real moral passion and can use the language uh, in, 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 in a way that, that, that's real. So we learned, uh, we learned the hard way and, you know, uh, through these endless Torah discussions, okay, and uh, which is not a model that I would subscribe to anymore because it just goes on and on and on. But I will say this, these open-ended Torah discussions teaches, teach you one thing, it empowers you to say, well, I, my voice also matters here. I, and if I don't have the answers, I have some interesting questions to ask. See, there's a barrier that has to be crossed. It's like when you're learning a foreign language and the first time you actually begin speaking it outside of the classroom, right? It's the same kind of thing. The first time you give a Dvar Torah and you put yourself into it, not, not a scripted thing, but, some, but you're using the Torah in a way to express something of your own. And where and how do you balance that? We figured out a new way of doing that. Um, I can't exactly articulate it, but I certainly know the difference between a good, you know, a, a 
Dvar Torah that comes out of that ethos that they don't teach you in rabbinical school, even to this day. Even to this day, homiletics is not taught very successfully at, uh, at JTS. And I speak from you know, many years of experience. They did not learn uh, the lesson of the Chavara. We have a lot to teach them about you know, a Dvar Torah. And this is, is something that even a place like Minyan Ma'at um, uh, has, has developed rather you know, successfully. It's very different from the traditional model. So uh, what happens in Shul uh, has changed. You know, that uh, davening can transport you. Uh, the davening can be edgy. That davening can surprise. The, the elements of surprise. Uh, that a Dvar Torah can, can come from and use and draw on sources far and wide. Um, the, what happens in, in that space in Shul, uh, I think we really redefined uh, the whole nature of it. And, and of course, uh, you know, the use of nigunim. Um, to flash forward to the present, I actually think that where the Chavara model is now percolating most profoundly is in Israel. And not just in Israel, but particularly in Yerushalayim, which has now become a kind of magnet and flashpoint for all kinds of innovative uh, minyanim. I and, and, and Shana go to, to these places, and it's deja vu all over again. They don't know where all of this is coming from. It's, a, it's 40 years later, and it, I understand why it took Israel 40 years to catch up because they had other things on their minds and you know, wars to fight and all kinds of other things that preoccupied them. So now the moment has come. It's not just the leader minion. There are new minyanim sprouting here, independent minyanim, uh, opening up all the time. And so the, we, uh, we were there at the very beginning and a lot of the things that they think they're innovating, uh, we came up with by ourselves. Uh, they didn't learn it from us, but I don't know, somehow or other, the process uh, did develop. I have, in, in, in my notes, I, have, I, I went to a conference two years ago uh, uh, organized by um, 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 Shira Hadasha, which was the first of these, which was actually a spin-off of the leader minion, of 17 independent uh, minyanim, the first time that they had met. Uh, all in, in uh, well, they were all from all over Israel. Some of them in the Negev, some of them in Haifa, some in Tel Aviv. Uh, so Shirah Hadashah was celebrating its bar mitzvah and decided that on the, that occasion they would bring, so there were already 17 groups. By now, two years later, there could have been f three times as many groups. So I think the transformative power went way beyond just America. When did you uh, come up with the the, the phrase, Pomo de, um, Davinus? Yeah, Davinus. I don't know. It was, came up as a joke, I think. Uh, a long time ago? Or yeah, yeah, a long time ago. I had to describe what happened to me. Uh, I, I needed a language to express the fact that I had learned a new language. I'd learned a new language. And learning a new language is not easy. It's not just the skills and learning the facility with it. To learn a language means to make it your own. So homo davenis means when the davening becomes, you own it as, as a means of self-expression. It's one of the ways in which you express who you are through your davening. It's not that you've memorized it or that you're, you, know, you know the words or what the words mean. It goes way beyond that. So I was looking for a phrase that would convey that next level of ownership. And I thought, well, davening is not to pray. Uh, davening is the business of prayer. It's to be at prayer. Yidin davenen doesn't mean Jews praying. It means Jews at prayer. It's, mu it's very physical. It's all, it's your whole body. It's everything. Um, it's everything around you. 
So, and the person doing that is a different kind of person. It's not your normal self. So, okay, let me, that's what I'm going to call it. Do you see the independent Minyanim and other independent people wrote that have evolved, but particularly the independent Minyanim as sort of living the legacy also of the original couple of Yeah, yeah, because uh, it's... Though many of them consciously do not call themselves... Of course not, of course not. And anyway, I mean, the, the liberties that we took, uh, halachic liberties, most of these independent Minyanim wouldn't even consider. Um, for them, pushing the envelope means egalitarianism and involving women, right? They're, they're coming from a very traditional place. Um, I, I once actually <laughs> lect, gave a lecture at Machon Hartman um, and told them the story of the Chavara. To, they were all Israelis and they were sitting there open-mouthed. They could actually, they could hardly believe what I was telling them the kinds of radical experimentations that we did and what we got away with in the name of, uh, you know, religious, uh, well, it's a kind of religious syncretism. Remember that we're in America. I mean, America is a place of, of radical experimentation. This couldn't have happened in Israel. Um, it, it, it's just built differently. America is open in that, in that way. And let's also remember um, the conversion experience, you know, uh, uh, Obama also went through a religious conversion experience around the same time that I did. And guess what? More than half of the American population has a religious conversion experience in their 20s. I don't know if there are other countries like that in the world where this is really very common, right? So we were part of something much larger than ourselves, and there was a lot of you know, support in the zeitgeist. Um, when you're turning 20 in Israel, you're, you're still in the army. You're, not, you, you're still a year or two away from going off to India. <laughs> yeah. um, you titled your talk at Brandeis, um, Kavara Shalom, a Utopian Experiment. I'm, I'm curious how close you think the, the original Chavarat Shalom came to achieving its vision and, and also what you think its greatest challenges were as you look back on it. So uh, let me use another metaphor, um, a Kabbalistic metaphor, uh, to answer your question. The metaphor is Tzim Tzum. Mm -hmm. So there's this really weird idea, the Big Bang Theory right, that God had to contract God's presence in order to leave room for the created world, because God was everywhere. So God had to, as it were, contract. And then out of that contraction came, okay. So I'm interested in the, the concept of Tsim Tsum, that in order to create, you have to contract. The core of that utopian moment is this. It was a moment in time where the brightest and the best that American or North American Jewry had created were in one place. I know this sounds very elitist, but I, I don't know how else to say it. It wasn't an inclusive group. There were those who were in and those who were out. And the, and the admissions process, which I just pussyfooted around it, was, could be very cruel. Could be very cruel. And there are people whom I've met in life who are still are scarred emotionally because they were rejected and, were not, and, and didn't understand why they weren't admitted into this inner circle. But once you were in that inner circle, uh, what you experienced was unbelievable. You had... Uh, people who, for whom being Jewish and expressing their Jewishness was the most important things in their lives. Uh, and, you know, I brought the whole show and tell, all these books that were created that would never have been created were it not uh, f for that uh, confluence. 
So you have a Stephen Mitchell, who on the verge of converting to Roman Catholicism decides that he wants to be Jewish and then learns Hebrew and then, and then sits down and translates the book of Job. But that's only act one. That's only act one. When he's in the Chavara, um, I introduced him to Ted Carmi, who was my teacher at Brandeis, a Hebrew poet. And he, and he, he, met in, in, he immediately recognized that T Stephen Mitchell was an extraordinary talent. So Stephen Mitchell started translating Ted Carmi. From that came uh, this book, you know, uh, Stephen Mitchell's translations of Don Pagis, of Don Pagis, one of the greatest and most important Hebrew poets. There are no better translations uh, of Don Pagis into English. And what's more, there isn't anyone who could have done a better translation than Stephen Mitchell. Okay, so the stars are, you know, beginning to align. Jim Kugel. I, when I first met Jim Kugel, he was learning Olive Bait. Okay, so I, the, the stack of books that Jim Kugel has, has produced uh, as, uh, is legion. He, he would not have gone that route. Coming where he came from, if it weren't for the Chavara, there's no way that he would have found his way back to Judaism uh, or, or, or to doing Bible. Remember, uh, Buzzy Fishbane was, I, we talk a lot about art, but the, the, the intellectual firepower in that room, uh, with, with Buzzy was just, uh, Michael, we, we all call him Buzzy, obviously, uh, Michael Fishbane was just finishing his doctorate. So the, the first book that he published is a, is very much an academic study of the structure of biblical narrative and it's very structuralist and but then the direction that he's going to take if it weren't for the Chavara he would not write a book of, about the hermeneutic imagination and and works on mysticism he wouldn't have blossomed into becoming uh, a theologian no way I mean you have because we were all together and we were feeding off uh, uh, of each other uh, Barry Holtz. Barry Holtz was an English major. Okay, so how do you make the quantum leap from being an English major at Tufts from writing back to the sources? Okay, well, this is the Bible. This is one of our, uh, you know, along with the Jewish catalog, this is what the Chavarah stands for, back to the sources. So here's the book, you know, Barry Holtz put together the book and brought all his friends together to write the chapters. Uh, uh, so that becomes the, the, the rallying call for American Jews uh, to do just that, okay? Um, and then there's my own work, if I, if I may. Um, since I was 16 years old, I was involved uh, in uh, Holocaust commemoration, something that was extremely important to me. I am not a child of survivors but I grew up in a survivor community. And for me, Eastern Europe was real. So real that if I could just stretch out, I could almost touch it. So uh, when I was in a senior in high school, I organized the first uh, Holocaust commemoration in Montreal run by young people, four young people. Then I went off to Brandeis and every year at Brandeis, I did another Holocaust commemoration got more and more elaborate. And then I kind of lost, then I realized I couldn't go any further. It was just, I joined the Chavara and it's December and I'm in a class on liturgy with Bert Jacobson. He's running a class on liturgy. And I think, what am I going to do for my final? Maybe I'll do a liturgy for Yom HaShoah this time. I've never written a liturgy. I, I've just learned the liturgy. <laughs> that shouldn't stop me. Uh, okay, maybe I've already led a service. Yeah, let's even uh, allow that I've already led a service. But I'm really pretty wet behind the ears. So that's going to be my assignment. I'm going to write, let me do a liturgy. How do I do that? 
And the inspiration for doing that was the Shabbat Zachor service led by Zalman uh, in 1969. And it was that moment, at the very end, when he started singing the Kaddish to the Partisans hymn. That became the creative... That was the moment of inspiration where I realized I, to do a Holocaust commemoration, I have to build it around that moment of short-circuiting the most sacred texts in the light of the Holocaust. That's going to be, that's going to be my liturgy. And as soon as I realized that, I knew what that moment was, namely, Ukshartam leot al yadecha, that in the Shema, you shall bind it as a sign on your arms. What does that mean? Obviously, it means the tattooed numbers on the arm. That's not the homiletic meaning, that's the literal meaning. That's what it really means. That's what it meant all along. I'm going to write a liturgy that's going to show that that's what it meant, that's, that it's already there, that that's what the biblical text is already alluding to. It's already, if, already incorporating that, uh, inc that idea. And then all the other counter, say, counter commentaries, all, all the other ideas fell into place. So I, I, the, uh, I wrote this liturgy. This is the uh, first edition of Night Words, right? Nacht Werther am Medrash von Choben, Night Words of Midrash on the Holocaust, Mile Laila, Midrash al Shoah, first read uh, for Yom HaShoah at the Chavura. So the first point, the first stage was the conceptual one, which I already had. Uh, but then, who was going to perform it? Well, that was obvious. I was going to write it for this group. And, and the model for liturgy, because the model for davening is in small groups, that if we are going to remember and we are going to commemorate, the way to do it is not in mass rallies, and it's not by bringing hundreds of people together in Madison Square Gardens. The way to do it is in your own community, within, within your own sacred space. That's where commemoration has to happen, and I am going to write a commemoration for 36 readers. All you need is a, th a quorum of 36, and then you have enough people, uh, and, then, and then later on it turns out you can double the roles, you can triple the roles, you can do it with less than 36, but you have to have a minimum of 36 readers, and I'm going to write this for 36 readers, and we performed it, and there was a discussion uh, actually uh, around this uh, because the ritual of the number, Okshatam Leot Al Yadecha, as I wrote it, uh, has a ritual component. It's not that only that you're going to read the passage, but everybody is going to have a number written on their arms with a, with a black felt pen. So that was a discussion item. Can we do this? Is this, this is pretty radical stuff. What would happen uh, Seymour Epstein asked, if a survivor comes, it's going to be open to the public. How can you do that? So the decision was made that if David wants this, we'll go with it. And guess what happened? A survivor did show up for the first reading of, of Night Words. Uh, and we were, and he had his own number on his arm. Uh, he didn't need another number on his arm. And then it, when we debriefed together after uh, the event, we, we asked him, well, well, what did you think? Well, and he said, I thought this was wonderful, that here was this group of young Jews who wanted to share in this, who wanted to have a number, who were, were not afraid of having a number on their arm. I thought that was extraordinary. Kol uh, kavod. I was very moved by it, he said. So this is only one of many examples. Um, I don't know whether he would, he would admit to this, um, but uh, Larry Fine's book on Safed spirituality, 
Would that have been written without the Chavara? We were the Safed, we were them. He's, this is autobiography. As far as I'm concerned, I read this, this is like a blueprint of Chavara Shalom. Why else would he have written this? <laughs> because he lived it for, he lived it the way I lived it. Um, right, and, and all these other books, uh, this, the, the New Jews. Uh, with Jim Sleeper. Jim, Jim Sleeper. So he was a member of our cohort. It's true he was just passing through and he went on to other things, but you know, this book is a very, very interesting document to its time. And, and it also, his, it tells you what the anger was and what um, the rebellion against suburban Judaism and the materialism and, you know, all the excesses of American society, which we didn't talk about. Um, Art Green proclaimed TV dinners to be morally treif. That was his halacha. Not that they're treif. You want to eat treif, you eat treif. They're morally treif. The idea of sitting around watching television and eating a meal out of a, out of a prepackaged thing is morally repugnant. Okay. Where would you put um, the Jewish catalog, the original Jewish catalog? And uh, uh, front and center. Canon? Front and center. I mean, that's, that's the Shulchan Aruch. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a do it. Uh, I have all three volumes here. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, that's a whole other subject of the evolution of the catalog from volume one till volume three. They're not uh, cut of the same cloth. The first one... Uh, uh, you know, has all kinds of, well, let's say the order of priorities is, is rather peculiar. Uh, it has much more to do with uh, making challah and, uh, and candles than, than any involvement in anything real. Uh, Soviet Jewry only appears in volume three, and um, the chapter on Israel is about how to schnorr your way through Israel. Okay, all right, so uh, there's a lot of uh, youthful excess. But still, the idea is do it yourself, do it yourself, do it yourself. Own it, own it. Own yeah, it. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. To go back to your, your um, utopian experiment uh, language, let's say it conveys a, um, a, a sense of impermanence. And indeed, the original, almost everybody was gone of the original cohorts was gone mm -hmm. by 74, 75. Yes. Art Green had left even to go on to uh, Penn at that point. Mm -hmm. Almost everybody had. Do you think, looking back, that Chavara Shalom was a sustainable model? And if not, what, what are the lessons of that? For okay, so some of it is, is and some of it isn't. What's sustainable is the idea of small is beautiful. And I think that was a very powerful corrective. Mm -hmm. Corrective to the large synagogue. Of Correct, yes. And the fact that there are now chavorot that are part of larger synagogues is a very positive development. Because people, uh, you know, uh, and we have this, we live this tension in uh, Anshe Chesed. We have this group on the fifth floor, and there's only room for 150 people, and that's it. No more than that can fit in. And then there's the main sanctuary. And we're all members of Anshe Chesed, and, the, and we do daven occasionally uh, in the main sanctuary, and it's not the same thing. But we have to support the shul, and we have to figure out a way of not undermining the viability of a synagogue and realizing that a synagogue represents a capital campaign and, and uh, plumbing, and you have to, you know, if you care about somebody, you care about their plumbing. Uh, so this is Minyan Ma'at, right? Which, yes. Which began in the Strasfeld's living yeah, room yeah. and moved to other people's living rooms. That's right. And at a certain point became part of Anshe Chesed. Exactly. What, is the, what, what was that transformation about and that transition? Well, it, it had to do, first of all, with saving a piece of, of, of real estate, that the shul was on the verge of physical collapse and was about to be bought up by rapacious developers. And if we didn't step in, that would be the end of a proud institution. And we went into it kicking and screaming because we weren't really grown up enough to realize 
you know, or willing, willing to take the responsibility for the upkeep of a building and, and everything that entails. But we had to grow into the role and figure out a way of finding a new model that would preserve our autonomy and still help uh, maintain and sustain uh, a, an organization. So it's, you know, we haven't found the ideal solution, and, uh, but it's a completely different model for, for a shul, uh, where inside the shul there are various uh, independent groups and sometimes we, get, we work together and sometimes we're separate. So I think that's all, all for the best. One of the real problems that is, we're still paying the price for is we, didn't, we really did not create a, a mo an alternative leadership model. I started by saying that you know, there was supposed to be at the end of the road a chaver, and that when you graduated you would be a chaver and you would be a new type of rabbinic model. Well, show me the chaver out there that's leading the Jewish community. Uh, show me the new leaders out there that we have generated. So yeah, so Art created his own rabbinical school. That's in recent years. In, in recent years, um, I'm not sure we succeeded there. I'm not sure that that that's. Um, Although many many people from the original cohorts yeah. went on to leadership positions. Yes. Well, the easiest direction was into Jewish scholarship. We created uh, the field of Jewish studies. So the Chavara, I mean, that was the easiest segue because we were all trained as in, 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 in education as educators. So we went into the field of education because that's what we knew how to do best. The nitty gritty of communal politics and rabbinic politics, that's, that's different. Um, look, uh, Mark, Mike Swirsky went on Aliyah. He left the Chavara soon after I did. He founded Pardes. He would never have founded Pardes if it hadn't been for Chavara Shalom. Never. Never. It's, it's a, a direct segue. And Pardes is, a, is in, a, in and of itself generated so many new models for a, what a yeshiva, that a yeshiva is not just a yeshiva anymore. It could be for anyone. Something so a lot of things came out of that, that moment in time. So yeah, it wasn't, but many things percolated. Utopia means that, you know, it's, so it's a flash in the pan, but it creates a model of what's possible. Something, and, and so it was possible. We did it once. A confluence of time and place and, and talent and, and what have you. And it can be done again in a different, in a different way, in a different guise. So finally, um as the challenges of the 21st century American Jewish community are coming into clearer view and we're standing at this moment just before the inauguration of Donald Trump as well. Are there lessons from the Chavara experience that you think will help us, can help us sort of navigate this new landscape um, and this new century from the Chavara movement and from the Chavara? Yeah that we, should, we can continue uh, find, that we can continue to reinvent ourselves. Yeah, that we can continue to reinvent ourselves. That uh, the past that we have is so rich. There's so many retrievable parts, or what I call uh, usable pasts. So the Chavara found in Hasidism, it's usable past. It's not the only model. Oh, and then we also grafted on the, uh, the Lair House. Okay, so we combined Rosenzweig's Lair House with the Hasidic, with, with the Baal Shem Tov and Reb Nachman, and we created this particular, wonderful, unique amalgam, and we called it Chavara. I think uh, that is a, the way to go. Uh, that it, uh, turning back and retrieving a piece of the past that speaks to us and reinventing it in, in light of our own needs, sensibilities, uh, intellectual concerns, curiosity, abilities, uh, that's, that's going to keep us going.
that is a viable model, no matter who's in power. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Your, your, your to God's ears, and thank you so much, Dominic.